Uh, good evening to everybody on uh, behalf of IAPT and SA. I uh, uh, welcome uh, one and all. And first, we will start with the periods in prayer by our treasurer, Dr. Kabal Subramani. Uh, we will start today's uh, DAP program with the uh, pediatrician prayer. Purandi Marathuni Nerangelan, Inglakum Rimia, Gunamalikim Terne Taram, Noir and Timbutir Pinteran, Namaka Varanga Porta, the Apati Porta Serepurimai, Enbade Panivudam, Namuru Maga, Elakur in the Kurukum, or the Kurumatinurukum, or Gulin Tabadai Padinere, Matam Sadi with the people of Paraman, Naram Petrel Ege, Anbu, Amaidi, Aguet, and Buzurla and Rupirpo Maga, Namal Mudinavitri Matam, Nalavitri Ulwangu, Matam Mudia and the Karan to Nate Polum, Pozaman and Mayeribu, Purzalim, Inglak Waranga. Ungla the Walter Lagim, Arulim, Karane, Ella Sural Gulum, Nerang Gulum, Anitum Kade, Kurta Arlan, Henry. Thank you, Kabal. Now I welcome our dynamic president, Dr. Ismail, EAPT NSA president, to deliver presidential address. Thank you, Rajendran. Good evening, all of you. Uh, this is a wonderful teaching program amidst the COVID pandemic. Of course, we are all enjoying it. As uh, Dr. Srinivasan said, we are able to listen to the doyens in pediatrics very often. Previously, it will be used to, used to be only in conferences in CMEs. Of course, the Zoom has Zoom platform has made us to listen to them frequently. So I welcome all the judges today for this program, and I welcome the cha <coughs> chairperson, Dr. Professor Lima Paul, and of course the chair, the moderators, my good friend Vel Muragan and Nandeshri Madam, and of course all the student <coughs> PGs who are going to present it today. And I wish you all a happy learning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, now it's my duty to um, uh, sir, uh, introduce okay. all the persons. And first of all, I welcome uh, Thirnal Valley uh, Government Medical College uh, postgraduate students. They are going to present here. And uh, I welcome uh, chairperson Dr. Pro uh, Dima Pauli, Professor of Pediatrics, uh, the Department of Pediatric Neurology, ICH. Uh, more. I welcome Dr. Lima, madam. I may be this is the third. Uh, uh, past, uh, time is, is, is participating in our teaching program. Yes, sir. And, thank you. Yeah, I welcome uh, Dr. S. Bell Murugan. He's a senior consultant pediatric neurologist, uh, GKNM Hospital and Coimbatore. He's uh, one of the uh, best teacher uh, for. Uh, he was a consultant at Apollo also, and he was a uh, best uh, teacher also. I welcome Dr. Bell Murugan. <clears throat> I welcome Dr. T. R. R. Anandasri, and he is a professor of pediatrics at Tirunal Valley Medical College. And uh, he is currently today is a moderator. I welcome all the postgraduates uh, uh, from Tirunal Valley Medical College, Madhava Sundari, uh, today's presenter, and Radman, and Dr. Narmada, all from the Tirunal Valley Medical College. I welcome all the judges, uh, Dr. Elilarsi, Madam, Dr. Janani Shankar. Dr. TRC sir and Dr. Srinivasan sir from Pondicherry. I welcome one and all for this wonderful uh, evening. Now it's over to Dr. Lima Pali. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I, I thank the organizers for the given opportunity. And uh, we have today a uh, uh, clinical presentation from uh, Thrunel Valley Medical College. And our uh, dear moderators, uh, Professor uh, Vail Murugan and Professor Anandi Shri. And I, I invite our uh, dear postgraduates uh, to be uh, to uh, to present their case, and without any fear to answer the questions and face the uh, examination. Yes. Without wasting the time, uh, let's uh, move on to the case presentation. Yes, Madhav Sundari. Good evening. Good evening to one present here. Now. Uh, I'm Madhava Sundari, postgraduate from Tirunelveli Medical College. I'm here to present a case uh, today in this forum. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. A child Sujita, three years old female child with the date of birth of 4918, second born out of third degree consanguous marriage, resident of Kalakudi, was brought by her mother whose reliability is good, has come with chief complaints of not attaining age appropriate developmental milestones since birth. Uh, as the event started from the antenatal period, I'd like to start the presentation from the antenatal history. Uh, 
married at 17 years to her cousin who was 25 years old and settled in mumbai menstrual history at time menarche at 12 years of age her cycles are regular once in 30 days with a medium flow lasting for 5 days uh, first child was a preterm delivery which died at 26 hours of life the cause was not known by the mother after 2 years of infertility after, after the 2 years of death from the 2 uh, years from the death of first child mother approached the same hospital for infertility treatment she discontinued the treatment after one year course and she wasn't aware of the medications uh, she took there after one year of discontinuing the treatment mother spontaneously conceived the second child uh, coming to the history of second child our case presentation today first trimester spontaneous conception at 24 years with interpregnancy interval of 5 years pregnancy confirmed by urine pregnancy test at 4 at 35 days LMP was 11/1/2018 and EDD was 18/10/2018. It was a booked and immunized pregnancy at a private hospital in Mumbai. She had she had regular antenatal visits to the same hospital. No history of periconsumption folic acid intake, no history of fever, rash, painful swelling behind the ears, no history of vomiting, no history of drug intake, irradiation or trauma. A mother was not a known case of hypertension, diabetes, asthma, seizure disorder. She was not on any medication for chronic illness. Coming to the second trimester, quickening was felt at 16 weeks. Anomaly scan was done at 20 weeks and was said to be normal. Took iron and folic acid tablets regularly. There is no history of PAH, GDM, seizures, or hypothyroidism in the mother. There is history of UTI at 28 weeks of pregnancy, uh, for which mother took tablets for 10 days. Uh, result and the mother was able to feel the fetal movements at that time. Third trimester, mother was perceiving the fetal movements well. USG abdomen done at 30 weeks showed. normal growth and like there is no history of aph ph or oligo polyhydramnios in the mother birth and neonatal history mother developed lower abdominal pain at 31 weeks gestation on 3 9 2018 around 11 pm at night which she ignored on 4 9 2018 at 8 am membranes were ruptured spontaneously at home then she was taken to the hospital where antenatal checkup was done and given some iv fluid and im injection Uh, she delivered around 2:30 pm on the same day total duration of the labor was 15 hours it was a preterm normal vaginal delivery with a birth weight of 1.5 kg the baby did not cry at birth the child was referred to another private smcu for birth asphyxia which was half an hour from that hospital baby was taken in private ambulance to go to support mother was also said that baby had a small swelling uh, midline swelling at the back and was assured that no treatment was required at that point of time coming to the birth and neonatal history the child was mechanically ventilated for 7 days on day 1 the child had seizures and was treated with anti epileptic day 7 the child was weaned from ventilator to o2 support on day 8 tube feeds were started day 9 the child was weaned to room yeah day 10 mri was taken reports are not available day 8 uh, 15 a palladi feeds were started a day 16 the child was discharged from the hospital with a weight of 1.42 kg no anti epileptics were given during the discharge history of presenting illness Pre, uh, it was a preterm baby not cried at birth history of snco admission and mechanical ventilation which was discharged discharged 15th day of life mother took the baby for regular follow up in the same hospital every week till 4 months baby said to have gained weight adequately uh, history of presenting illness at 2 months the child gained social smile at 3 months uh, the baby recognized mother 6 months stranger anxiety was present Seven months chewing sound was present against two months, uh, which uh, the age which it had, uh, which it has to be probably attained. Wide extras grasp was present at seven months only against four months. At eight months, the child attained unit extras grasp against six months. At nine months, child attained head control against four months. Monosyllables at uh, nine months says bye bye. As the child did not attain age appropriate milestones, the mother took the child to the same hospital and she was reassured that a no evaluation was done at that time. At ten months, uh, the child attained rollover, which was again the five months. Uh, which, at which time it has to be probably attained. At one year, the child was sitting with support again six months. Immature pincer grasp at one year against nine months. Bi syllable at, at, uh, at one year against nine months. One and a half year commando crawl was present. The family got shifted to Sirnal Valley. Where she took the baby to a private hospital. MRI was taken and the midline swelling was operated. Uh, the, the, uh, the operation uh, the stay was three days in the hospital. after that the mother was advised to continue physiotherapy in sirnal valley medical college and hospital at two and of years the child was standing with support against 10 months and speak sentences at three years the child is not able to stand without support the child is able to scribble and she says her name 
Coming to history of higher functions, the child is aware of the surroundings, interacts with mother, no behavioral disturbance. The child is able to speak well in sentences. There is no history of excessive sleep or lack of sleep, any, any sleep disturbances, not able to stand. History of cranial nerves, there is no history of difficulty in appreciating smell, no history of visual disturbances, no history of abnormal eye position or drooping of eyelids, no history of loss of sensation over face, no history of drooling of saliva, difficulty in closing eyes, collection of food in cheek, facial asymmetry, deviation of angle of mouth, the child responds to sound and speech, no history of hearing difficulty, no history of nasal regurgitation, swallowing difficulty, change in voice, the child is able to turn head side to side, shrug shoulder as absorbed by the mother while wearing dress, the child is able to... Uh, the, uh, history of motor system. Uh, the history of stiffness was noted in all four limbs from one year. More in lower limbs, improving with regular physiotherapy. History of scissoring of legs from one and a half years. History of difficulty in changing diapers. Difficulty in standing. There is no history of difficulty in reaching objects. No history of difficulty in rising arms above head. Previously, the child had difficulty in mixing food. Now, with physiotherapy, the child can mix food. Child is able to pick up objects, pick small objects. There is no history in difficulty in uh, difficulty in turning side to side on the bed. The child is able to get up, uh, get up from supine to sitting position, but not able to get up. Yeah, Madhav Sundari. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Madhav Sundari. Dr. Vel Murugan sir actually wanted to ask you some question. So, during presentation of our uh, exam going pages, always know you should be prepared. So examiners sometimes may allow you and at the end of your history, they will ask you questions or at any point they can interrupt and they can ask you questions. Okay. Now, sir, actually put in the chat that sir want to ask you some questions. So you answer yeah. that, then you proceed. Okay. No, no. Just a couple of things. Um, when you start anything on, uh, when you say you are going back to the history, the history always goes to the family history. So you go back onto the family and then come down. You should always important to mention the family history if there's anything. Because uh, when you, it's not antenatal, it's not the start. It's not even the marriage. It's even okay, before sorry, the marriage. Okay. 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 Thank you. Like, and the second thing, um, uh, you've gone through uh, about uh, the MRI scan. You just said it's an MRI scan. It's very mm-hmm. important to find out what the MRI scan was. So the MRI scan was uh, done and the surgery was done. Yes, sir. Uh, so that uh, needs to be clarified exactly. Did they do the, just the spine or did they do the spine and head? And what is the importance of doing the MRI of the head as well when you have just a small swelling in the, brain, in the back? Do you know the reason why, why should they should do an MRI scan of the head as well when you see a, a small swelling in the back and then they are doing an MRI? And considering surgery, and the mother is actually not aware of the details. The mother is not having any reports uh, presently. Um, as there was cell, uh, as there was a swelling in midline at back, uh, I suspect it to be uh, spinal uh, uh, spina bifida like uh, defect, spin, spin, spinal dysphagism. So I'd like to take the MRI of brain also so that I can rule out some anomalies like Arnold Cherry malformation. More important than they are more associated, more often associated with the hydrocephalus. They can develop uh, um, hydrocephalus, and that's very important reason. If you see a swelling at the back, the head has to be pressured on a regular basis. Very careful because they will develop hydrocephalus. Yes, sir. Many of them will. Okay, that is yes, something which is expected. It's just a clinical stuff. Too. Um, okay. Then the other interesting, uh, important point that was like the child did not cry at birth. Now, yes. that is a very simple way of putting it. There should be more information on that. There's got to be some notes or other because you can say that ventilated for seven days. There's got to be something on to say why the child did not cry at birth and what was done. And day one itself, the seizures have happened. So if the seizures are day one, that means there's been a significant birth asphyxia and they are to treat with anti-epileptics. And, but within seven days, they have stopped it. So what was the reason for it? And those, again, it's very important to just pick on those because a child who's ventilated for seven days as well. And usually birth asphyxia, they don't need ventilation for seven days. It's usually the ventilation is much, much shorter. Actually, the mother is not aware of the details, sir. The mother is not having any details. Uh, but only by the history, uh, what she said, uh, we came... Did she get you any notes or anything, ma'am? 
No, sir. She is not having any notes, sir. As the treatment was all done in Mumbai, she lost all her uh, material there, sir. Uh, it is from the words of mother. But I really uh, appreciate that you have noted down. Yes. Okay, that's fine. But really appreciate that you are taking the detail about folic acid, not taking folic acid uh, through. So, which is quite good. Um, okay, ma'am. So, these are just a few points I just wanted to mention. Um, maybe like I'll probably go from slide to slide, and then as we finish up that slide, I'll, if there's any comment, I'll stop you there. Is that okay? Hello, Mark uh, Sir, uh, it's not here, not sir. Uh, uh, Madhav, sorry, that's a minute. Uh, yeah, I want a clarification from Dr. Velmurgan, sir, and Lima Pauline, madam, and also the yes. judges. Yes, uh, so, we are teaching our PGS to present from the antenatal history. Uh, so far, they are presenting in their summative uh, examination, uh, final clinical examination. So, can we start from the family history? Uh, Lima Pauline, madam, and uh, also Dr. Adirdhan, sir. But the usual teaching is uh, whenever there is a case of developmental delay is presented, it is uh, usually we tend to say that uh, since the all the symptoms are uh, present since young infancy, yeah. we, I would like to start from the antenatal history. Okay. Family history will come uh, later only, madam. Okay. That's yeah. number one. Number two is uh, in another way they can present, they can go ahead with the history of present illness. What are the problems right now the child is having? And then uh, go back to and uh, uh, like uh, history of present illness, past illness, then they can go for this uh, natal, uh, antenatal, natal, postnatal, then developmental history like that also. But usually it is uh, it begins with the antenatal the history. Antenatal That's history. number one. That's number two is uh, regarding the presentation, regarding your, uh, uh, you, you are telling about the developmental history. I would be uh, happy if you uh, tell me the developmental milestones according to the domains. You have intermixed everything. Okay, that is number two. Number three is, uh, other questions I think I will ask you later, Ma. You proceed. Uh, yes. Okay. yes. And no, the third thing is, uh, we just don't like uh, saying this history of motor system, history of cranial nerves like that. We will be presenting it as, as if we are telling a story or we are explaining something. Yes, Not ma. like uh, in between. Under history of present illness, everything will be coming. Okay. okay. Not like a history of higher function, history of cranial nerves, history of motor system. That we should remember. We all, we teach you like that because uh, as uh, whatever the side heading is there in the examination, all those things you have to remember and ask questions pertaining for each and everything. That's what we used to teach you. So you should, you need not say history of motor system, history of sensor system like that. Okay. Yes, Avoid yes, that and go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Can I continue, sir? Ah, yes, ma'am. Go on. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, history of stiffness noted in all four limbs from uh, year one, more in lower limbs, improving with regular physiotherapy, history of scissoring of legs from one and a half years, History of difficulty in changing diapers, history of difficulty in standing, history of difficulty in reaching objects, no history of no history of difficulty in reaching objects, no history of difficulty in rising arms above head. Previously, child had difficulty in mixing food. Now with physiotherapy, the child can mix food. She is able to pick small objects. No history of difficulty in turning side to side on bed. Child is able to get up from supine to sitting position, but not able to stand. No history of involuntary movements, no history of difficulty in appreciating clothes over body. No history of difficulty in appreciating warm and cold temperatures or difficulty in appreciating insect bites. The child cries during immunization. No history of nodding movement of head, abnormal eye movements. No history of difficulty in speech. No history of tremor or placidity as noted by the mother. No history of bladder bowel incontinence, bowel control not attained. No history of flushing of skin, uh, skin sweating or coldness. No history of giddiness. Uh, there is history of lament-sized midline swelling in the lower back at birth. Uh, swelling closed, soft, cystic, no discharge from the swelling, no pain on touching, surgically removed at one and a half years, no history of spinal deformities, no history of abnormal uh, size in the shape and head. History of deformities at bilateral ankle joints since age 2, child was gaining weight adequately, no history of recurrent regurgitation, recurrent respiratory tract infection or ear, ear infection, no history of swallowing difficulty, wet stroke, callosity, no history of further seizures beyond ne neonatal period, no history of uh, defect in vision or hearing. No history of constipation, urinary complaints. There is no history of breathlessness, easy fatigability, breathing difficulty, cough, abdominal distension, or jaundice. There is no history suggest. Uh, there is also history suggestive of intrauterine infection. No history suggestive of genetic problem like dysmorphic phases or congenital anomalies. 
no history of early morning hypoglycemia unusual urine order poor weight gain recurrent seizure no history of delayed passage of meponium poor feeding lethargy dry skin constipation or prolonged jaundice no history suggestive of pro thrombotic conditions or no history suggestive of coagulation abnormalities in this uh, coming to the development history uh, gross motor history milestones head control was attained at 9 months against 4 months roll over 10 months against 5 months sitting with support 1 year against 6 months crawling 1 and 1/2 years against 10 months standing with support 2 and 1/2 years against 10 months standing uh, without support not attained um developmental age is 9 uh, months for 36 months and developmental quotient is 25 for this child for gross gross motor for fine motor wide extra grass at 7 months against 4 months you need extra grass 8 months against 6 months pinsa grass 1 year uh, against 1 year draw circle at 3 years against 3 years developmental age 2 years developmental quotient 66 coming to the social uh, social uh, development uh, milestones social smile at 2 months against 2 months recognizes mother at 3 months against 3 months change her anxiety 6 months against 6 months waves bye bye 9 months against 9 months knows name 3 years against 3 years developmental age 3 years developmental quotient is 100 language monosyllable 9 months against 6 months bisyllable 1 year against 9 months speak sentences 2 years against 2 years says name 3 years against 3 years developmental age 3 years developmental quotient 100 no history of any developmental regression mother is aware that it is a chronic problem and needs long term treatment coming to diet history uh, she was exclusively breastfed till 5 months after that formula feeding was started with bottle feeding along with was started at 7 months now the child eats food from family pot Uh, with the diet, 24 hours dietary recall, and the child intake is 1,380 kilocalories against 1,600 kilocalories, and proteins of 20 grams against 21 grams. The deficit of 220 kilocalories and 1 gram protein. In, uh, immunization history: immunized up to age according to universal immunization schedule. Last vaccination one and a half years. Next vaccination at five years. No optional vaccines are given. No history of uh, adverse events following immunization. Coming to the family history. Uh, there was death of previous sibling the first child who was spontaneously conceived after 2 years of marriage pregnancy booked at private hospital in mumbai antenatal period was uneventful usg abdomen was said to be normal baby was delivered by pre term normal vaginal delivery at 28 weeks gestation due to premature rupture of membrane B- baby's birth weight was 1.2 kg uh, it cried soon after birth admitted in the same snchu for pre term care and respiratory distress died at a day a second day of life mother is not aware of the birth The third child uh, is a term baby, 2.9 kg, cried at birth, no, no developmental abnormalities. There is no history of any neurological abnormalities or other systemic illness in the family. No history of unexplained death in the family. There is no history of allergy to drugs or food. No history of uh, contact history. There is no history of contact with tuberculosis patient or COVID positive patient. Coming to environmental history, lives in Pakka house with two rooms, kitchen and toilet. Family of four people uses boil tap water for drinking, takes waste disposal and common garbage bin. No pets at home. Social economic history: uh, the ch- uh, the child comes under upper lower class according to modified Kupuzami scale. Summary: uh, Can I proceed with the summary, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, a three years old child, second born of third degree consanguineous marriage, significant perinatal history of preterm delivery, not cried at birth, neonatal seizures. Ventilated for one week with feeding issues for two weeks, midline swelling in the back, probably meningocele, which was operated at one and a half years. Predominantly motor developmental delay with stiffness of all four limbs, which improved with with physiotherapy. Uh, impression being spastic diplegia. No, the summary is I will be asking questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, Murugan. Dr. Vel Murugan. Okay, let me begin with my questions. First mm-hmm. of all, in the antenatal period, you had a history of UTI. What is the significance? Uh, UTI. The mother is, had a UTI. Yes, is it not? Hmm. Uh, it lead to uh, intrauterine infections. Will cause uh, uh, preterm delivery in the baby. Mummy can lead to periventricular leukomalacia. It can cause an. Uh, it can cause a sepsis. May not be an UTI. May may have been uh, associated sepsis, which can cause a chorea amniotis. That's what you have to say. Which can cause placental thrombi, placental infarct, like that. Okay, right. Then, uh, uh, then you said, "Amma, 
uh, this child is also a preterm the earlier child is was also a preterm and this child also a preterm okay mm -hmm. and then uh, so uh, during her antenatal checkups and all she knew that uh, the child was a preterm uh, the child was uh, having a low birth weight and all no ma'am she was said that the child was normal normal yes, but uh, they were not able to identify that the child had the uh, child was uh, below the normal weight yes, is it so yes ma'am okay was there any history of leaking membranes because there was uh, this is only a second uh, baby uh, so but uh, the the um, what is it called so uh, the uh, stages of labor were somewhat uh, somewhat prolonged is it not 15 hours ma'am yeah. stage 1 and stage 2 together 15 hours for this uh, mm -hmm. what there was there any history of fever at that time or any history of uti at that time was there any history of um, leaking membranes membranes ruptured know. outside No, no. ma'am. No, was ma it a spontaneous? Was it an induced labor or a or a, the mother uh, had labor pains uh, by her by uh, spontaneous only? Mother had labor pains spontaneously, ma'am. Okay. The day and the child delivered by normal uh, vaginal uh, uh, labor natural, is it not? Yes, But the child did not cry at birth. Yes, okay. And the child was admitted in the NICU. And the child developed seizures on day one. Yes, ma'am. Was there any other uh, problems, uh, neonatal uh, jaundice, uh, respiratory distress, etc.? No, no, ma'am. According to mother, uh, there was no history of any jaundice. Okay, tell me what are the causes for seizures in the newborn period on day one? Day one, uh, birth asphyxia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia. Mm. Uh, early hypo hypocalcemia. You have to say early hypocalcemia. Okay. Mm. Early hypocalcemia. Mm. Any use of sedatives in the mother? Local very good ingestion of local anesthetic in the fetal uh, ah that and all was previously it has been done during uh, your uh, they uh, people will be doing in those days uh, instrumental deliveries for that they may have to give local anesthetics though so you have to use the word inadvertent use of uh, local anesthetics into the fetal scalp mm. um, and then any drug with maternal drug withdrawal seizures ah maternal drug withdrawal very good rakana and uh, you haven't told me about the uh, type of seizures or whether the child had only one episode or multiple episodes how many anti convulsants were used like that and all you haven't given me any information my dear yes, uh, mother is not having any reports at present ma'am only with the history you can I ask the history whether uh, you were told a mother uh, you know most in all the uh, government medical college hospitals or government hospitals and all mothers are allowed to be with the newborn is it not So you can ask the mother whether uh, the child had recurrent seizures like that. Uh, uh, according to the history from mother, uh, mother says that the child had only one episode of seizure, and after yeah. that the child did not have any seizure, ma'am. Mm. Uh, and the cause for being in ventilator for one week is uh, poor mm. respiratory effort in the baby was uh, that said to the mother, ma'am. Mm. Were there any other complication of a preterm was there in this particular patient? Yeah, madam. Uh, ma'am, uh, can I intervene? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, please, Madam Sundari, he told uh, the child was born in a private hospital, but the baby was shifted to another private hospital. Yes, mother, the baby was shifted with the mother. That is uh, that is important, no? Yes, ma'am. First, the mother was not shifted, ma'am. The next day, okay. only as it was normal vaginal delivery, the next day itself, the mother was also shifted to the same private hospital, ma'am. Okay. But whether so the mother private, was allowed yeah. to see the baby. Um, actually, the mother was not allowed to see the baby, ma'am. Only uh, it, the condition was said to the mother. Uh, Okay, yeah, that should be you know briefly uh, discussed that. And if Madam is asking, you no, know, what happened in the perinatal period? The baby has been you no, know, even it has not cried at birth, preterm baby, but it was uh, with the oxygen support. It is transferred to another hospital. Whether the temperature was maintained during the travel and all, that is also you no know, yes. contributing factor which might potentiate the asphyxia. Yes. Okay. Okay, ma'am, you can continue. Okay, Dama. Uh, more, moreover, you can tell us about whether the the child underwent uh, any ultrasonogram cranium because uh, in the uh, nowadays uh, everyone is do, uh, we are doing uh, routinely this ultrasonogram cranium for the for the children. Especially in this case, this is a child. Uh, this is a preterm child. So, mm -hmm. uh, so intraventricular subependymal intraventricular hemorrhage was there or not? We have to. We need to look at. So uh, whether it has been done for this particular baby? No, ma'am. The mother is not no. aware of that. No. Okay. Whether the child had sepsis? Whether the child had any uh, hyaline membrane disease? Something like that? Respiratory distress? Ma'am, the respiratory distress was present in this child, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, but uh, no. What was it due to? What was it due to? Respiratory distress syndrome. 
Pardon me, da. Um, uh, because of preterm delivery, respiratory distress syndrome um, would be the probable cause, ma'am. Mother is not aware of the cause, ma'am, but she said that the whether X-rays were done, whether the child, whether the baby was given something, uh, your uh, your uh -huh, surfactant, sir. like uh, all those things, you have to ask. Okay, yes, yes. people will be knowing, so my parents will be informed uh, uh, for every procedure, so they can give us some more details, even if if we are not allowed to look at the. Uh, discharge summaries and all. In exams, we are not provided the discharge summary. So, from the mother's uh, perspective or from the mother's words only, we have to gain all this information. Yes. And again, small swelling in the back, you are telling. What was the swelling? Whether it was a myelomeningocele or a meningocele? That we have to distinguish. Is it not, my dear? Yes, ma'am. How to distinguish between a meningocele and a myelomeningocele? What mm -hmm. is meningocele first? Meningocele is a... Uh, um... Uh, the membranes, the meninges covering the spinal cord is protruding. protrusion of the just the meninges from the defect in the uh, vertebral column. Okay, what is myelomeningocele? Uh, defect along with the spinal uh, spinal cord along with the meninges. meninges. Okay, the clinically, how to distinguish between the both? Ra? Uh, meningocele is a purely cystic swelling and it is trans trans illuminance. Mm. Uh, but meningomyelocele is a not not a trans illuminance swelling. Mm. More than that. There won't be any focal neurological deficit in a child with a, in a baby with a meningocele. Here there is only a protrusion of the membranes. It's not the cord. Okay. So there won't be any focal neurological deficit. That is meningocele. Whereas in a myelomeningocele, since the cord is also protruding out, you will be having what is the commonest picture in a myelomeningocele. Neurological. Mm. Tell me. And uh, uh, bladder incontinence will be present. What did you say, ma? First line, what did you say? Paraplegia, ma. Paraplegia. Ah. Para you have to say flaccid paraplegia with air flexia. So, air flexic flaccid paraplegia with the sensory involvement, the child will not be able to perceive sensations. So, with the sensory involvement and fecal and urinary incontinence. This is what we expect. Okay, okay ma? And okay. As, sir, as sir has pointed out, uh, the dictum is any problem in the uh, back or in the spine. You have to measure the head circumference to look at uh, to look for whether there is any associated hydrocephalus or, as you said, is there any associated arnal cherry malformation. Similarly, any newborn or any uh, infant with the hydrocephalus, you have to look at the back to look for spinal anomalies. What are the other spinal anomalies will you look for in a child with uh, such a presentation? Now, this is this child had a swelling. Whether this is a spina bifida occulta or a aperta? Spina bifida occulta, ma'am. Good. What are the telltale evidence for or external markers for spina bifida occulta? Occulta, any uh, sacral dimple, ma'am. Uh, the size of the dimple, if it is to be significant, it should be more than 5 mm size and more than 2.5 cm uh, from the anal verge. Good. Uh, any, Very good. Uh, hmm. Uh, any uh, any tail like any hemangioma, lipoma, mm. or mm. any um... tough tough hair, hemangioma. Uh -huh. mm. Okay, so these are the things you have to look for, sir. Well, Murugan, sir, uh, you are there, sir. Not... Please, sir. Uh, I had cut off. I've been cut off, so I'm just. Uh, that's why. That's why I was <laughs> questioning her. Please okay. go ahead, sir. Please. Ah, uh, thanks, ma'am. Um, so the main differential diagnosis here, anyone is going to be interested is like. Uh, I do not have uh, as much experience as mom in uh, going through it from your exam point of view, uh, but mine is more like a clinical one, which people would ask you these questions um, if they are, they are examining you. So those are the main things uh, that I was going to go through. Um, so like you talk about vision and hearing impairment, what is the significance of that when you're talking about a child with spastic diplegia or even with... Um, uh, spina bifida or we can have associated uh, cranial abnormalities. The child can also have any refractory errors, squint or cranial um, um, palsy associated. Sir. Cortical blindness can also be present. Sir. Oh, why would you expect cortical blindness? In which condition would you expect, ma? Would you do that? Like, see, the main differential diagnosis here, you need to be very clear about it. Is it spastic diplegia or is it a spina bifida, which is causing the problems? So, ma'am had gone through very clearly about that, how to differentiate that and what you need to look for in the legs and uh, particularly looking at the bowel and bladder. Bowel and bladder is the most important thing because 
it's very unusual to have bowel and bladder involvement in a spastic diplegia. So ma'am has gone through that very clearly about that. Now, what I'm talking about is just about vision and hearing. Say if it is a spastic diplegia, what can be the reason why you can have vision and hearing impairment? And uh, if it was uh, uh, um, spina bifida, what would be the reason? Both vision and hearing. So, um, am I yes, clear? Madam Sundari, in any case of neurological uh, uh, diseases, no, or yeah. developmental problem, what are the causes for associated uh, vision defect or even blindness, vision impairment? Is clinical correlation with the developmental delay and uh, no vision? What are the things that can be in the eye or within the central nervous system? You know it. So, getting the answer from you. We are trying. Optic neurosis, optic atrophy, Her friends are. Uh, yeah, others no? can also answer. Ah, yeah, two more people yeah. are there. Yeah. Abdul Rahman. Sorry. <laughs> Rahman. And Narmada. Yeah. So, if you know the answer, say. Otherwise, you can say that explain. you don't know. So, without yeah. wasting. Go. Yeah. The usual thing what happens in spastic diaphragia is not when most of them have good vision. They don't have a problem with the vision. But there is a small group whose vision will be very severely affected. And that's where, like, uh, getting an MR scan image would be so very important. So, in a presentation, a child like this, it's very important to get hold of the scans because you can look at the tracks involved and how significantly it is affecting the um, white matter, uh, periventricular white matter, and uh, what really is going on too. So that is a that is one of the main reasons why we really want to. And then sometimes even when you get that, you won't get the same image. The same image. Uh, same kind of injury, you will see one with very poor vision and another one with completely normal vision. So, when you look at spastic diaphragia itself, that is not a common condition where you will have vision problems. But when you take uh, have a, when you see a problem a child with um, spina bifida, the hydrocephalus is one of the very common reasons why the vision and hearing will just gradually go away. And that is something you will not even recognize and that is something you need to watch over a period. It's not something to be looked at one point and say, yes, at this point, the vision and hearing is okay and we can leave it. No, you need to monitor the head circumference. That's why ma'am was so very clear about head circumference. It's one of the most important things to look at any small, uh, even a spina bifida occulta, I would always monitor the head circumference. Uh, I monitor head circumference for everyone too, anyway. So that's uh, getting crazy, but... That, that's so, so important that you need to monitor that because sometimes all you will see is just a hearing and vision going away is the first sign of hydrocephalus in children. So that's why it's very important. There are things which we can change and those are the things which needs to be monitored clinically, very, very important. Here, the other things you had talked about is about stiffness of all four limbs. Um, I, I didn't see the examination. Uh, was there an increased tone or was there uh, dystonia or was there spasticity in the examinations? Uh, the examination, sir. Actually, the child had increased the tone. Spasticity was present. So it was spasticity. Yes, the spasticity. So which group of muscles were particularly affected? Anti-gravity muscles, sir. Sorry? Uh, Anti-gravity muscles. Flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb, sir. Right. Okay. So you put it very simply. Uh, I always struggle with that uh, particular description. Um, so, do you know the difference between diplegia and the hemiplegia? Which is yes, the sir. group of muscles which should be affected? Uh, diplegia, the involvement is, uh, all four limbs are involvement, with involvement of lower limb more than upper limb. Hemiplegia, uh -huh. one half of the body is involved. Sir. If it is double hemiplegia, both the sides will be involved, with involvement of upper limb more than lower limb. Right, okay. So the, within the di diplegia and hemiplegia, yes, which group of muscles the lower limb will be affected more? Diplegia, sir. Sorry, ma? 
Nightly, nightly, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, but I'm asking about the group of muscles. See, when you see, a, a, I, I can't expect you to remember, know all this, but uh, when you watch uh, diplegias, uh, the main group of muscles which will be particularly affected will be the hamstrings. Yes, sir. Okay. Hamstrings is the one which will cause, and then the adductors. Those are the two which will particularly be affected, and then that will cause a, quite a significant uh, crouching gait. You will never see a kind of a crouching gait type in uh, hemiplegia. So, although it's only one leg affected, very unusual. You will not get a, a adductor or a hamstring tightness. The tightness almost invariably affects only the calf muscle. And uh, if anything, they'll usually be hyperextending their knee. Okay. So, whenever you see a symmetry, like when you see one side is being affected more than the other, and then you have an involvement of the um, uh, hamstrings and adductors look very carefully at the MR scan because the usual MR scan finding will, that will be of a PVL, one side more than the other, and that would be called kind of asymmetric diplegia. So, where one side would be more affected than the other side. So, that would be asymmetric diplegia. So, this is something for you to just keep in mind. So, when you see a difference, we don't have to jump into and say this is definitely a hemiplegia because the asymmetry can be so significant that you can easily get caught out. Because when you do the MR scan, you will find a PVL and they'll ask you, how do you explain this? There's a PVL there and here there's a child who's uh, looking at just one side is affected. What, what is the difference? So those things you need to be able to understand. It will help you. Uh, this is more kind of clinical stuff really. Okay. Um, Ma'am, is there anything else through? So I will yes, just. Sir, uh, uh, sir Rajendra and Sir, at what point. time we have to finish, sir? <laughs> we can keep on talking. Uh, I think we can go on a little bit longer. Yeah, to 9 yeah. Madam, 9 sir? 9 30, Madam, 9 30. 9 30. So we have plenty of time. Okay. My dear, yes, please. Go uh, go to the history. Or uh, you, your summary says what is the main problem for this child? It is a global developmental delay. More of motor. You have said. Uh, yeah. Now yeah. tell me what is developmental delay? When will you consider uh, consider a particular child is having a developmental delay? A global developmental delay is just when... Pardon me, it is not global I am asking. First of all, say yeah. tell me about a developmental delay. When will you yeah. consider a child is having a developmental delay? Delay in age appropriate milestones, ma'am. Is there uh, any... Uh, domains, uh, domains should be involved, ma'am. Gross motor, fine motor. Uh, so when the child is not uh, not achieving or not uh, attaining the pro age appropriate milestones, that is when the uh, developmental uh, when the developmental milestones are uh, more than two standard deviation below the normal for that particular age uh, age and sex, then you call it as a age. More than two standard deviation below the that particular age, then you consider that that particular child is having a developmental delay. When will you say that the child is having a global delay? When there are two uh, domains in more than two domains involvement, uh, child two or more. Be specific, my dear. <laughs> two or when more two or more domains are involved, then you call it as a global delay. To be honestly speaking, there will be an uh, involvement of the, all the domains. Okay, so uh, and you have nicely pointed out, uh, uh, depicted or described the milestones in the developmental history in each developmental domains very nicely. And whereas I have only one question, uh, you have told me about uh, till one year or one and a half years, then you have uh, uh, straight away jumped to th three years and what happened in between. Uh, okay, so just to check your developmental history, it will be from first year to uh, then uh, it will be to third year. Okay, in between also you have to say. One more point I have to know, uh, I have to tell you, that is stranger anxiety. Stranger anxiety, the, uh, the timing is, or the uh, or the month uh, it is nine months it is not six months yes ma'am okay, okay ma stranger anxiety nine months yes, okay that uh, uh, you people have to read there are certain particular milestones which are achieved at the particular months so yes, those things not yes, every milestone you need to remember at Nima least the prominent yes yes ma'am ma can i interfere Yes, so yes, actually, yes. that is what uh, I have also taught them. That is by nine yeah. months only stranger and nitty comes. Mm. She has but put it as six months, months, madam. Yeah, yeah. Because no, she, she can't do her uh, whatever she had read from the books. I oh, Because I no, he has, uh, she has also shown me all the books. 
where it is given stranger anxiety as six months ma'am. So I was also surprised. Actually, I uh, wanted to get. Uh, we have to verify, ma'am, because she uh, she has read from the books now. Okay. Then uh, we have to ask our senior panelist also. So that was also a surprise to me, ma'am. I asked yeah, all the previous. They were saying that the answer. Ma Which book, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Gopika, yeah. No, ma'am. They are. Ma uh, yeah, Madhu Sundari. Feelings what, ma'am? Feelings what, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. But the usual teaching is uh, nine months only, no, ma'am. That's what we we read and we used to teach the postgraduates. Can I, I have to verify, ma'am? But nowadays, I think it appears by six months, and usually it lasts till uh, nine to ten months. That's what I remember. But okay, uh, sir. if the book say it is, I think we have to accept that it is six months. Yeah. Then we have to accept. Yeah, occurrence that yearly at six months is not a problem. That is uh, seen in some children. We are taking okay. a majority of the children when they get it. Okay, so some children will feel anxious even at uh, six months. That is okay. That is the beginning. But okay, we sir. are talking about uh, no 95 percentile. How much of them will be definitely mm -hmm. having? Yeah, that is why that nine months is given. Okay, Madam, sir. Madam, uh, am I clear? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Then uh, uh, go to the history, ma'am. History of present illness. Next. 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 Yeah, stiffness was noted by the mother in all the four limbs from the four, from one year of age. Okay. There was scissoring of both the lower limbs present. What does it signify? When there is a difficulty in changing diapers, what does it signify? Lower limbs don't be Plasticity of the lower limbs. Ma, One more ma thing. Ma'am is asking about the muscle group, ma. Very clearly muscle group. So changing the nappy, it's very difficult to do this. Which muscle group will be affected is what ma'am is asking very clearly. It denotes? Adductor muscle spasm. Ah, very good. Adductor muscle spasm, adductor spasm. Okay, then only you will be having this uh, difficulty in changing the diapers. Very good, Rachala. Next, so there was no history of weakness in the upper limbs. That's what you have to uh, you have uh, mentioned from this uh, this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Next. And uh, do you expect a sensory involvement in this particular child? No, ma'am. Sensory involvement is not present in spastic diabetes, yes, ma'am. For that matter, CP, uh, uh, cerebral palsy is a motor disorder, my dear. There is no question of sensory involvement at all. However, in this particular child, you had a history of swelling in the back. So that particular, that swelling in the back in the newborn period has to be described in detail, whether there were any history of weakness of the limbs, whether there was any uh, sensory involvement. That uh, initially itself you had to say. Otherwise, no history of sensory disturbances you can say in a, in a single line or else you can omit that in a, in, a, in presenting a child with a CP because we know pretty well that there is no sen involvement of the sensory system in CP. Okay, next. And again, cerebral system. Uh, you can say there were there are there are no there was no history of any clumsiness of movements rather than uh, saying it one by one. Okay. okay. Uh, next, do you expect a cerebellar signs in a child? If it is so, then what will what will you call it as? Uh, you have to say it is a mixed CP. Okay, but uh, it is not so common to have cerebellar signs in a uh, child with a cerebral palsy. And again, uh, involuntary movements, you have to say, as uh, Velmuruvan sir said, you have to say there were no history of involuntary movement or no history of abnormal posturing of the limbs. Uh, by saying that abnormal posturing, you are meaning a dystonia. Okay, Dama. Next, again, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, from whether the child has achieved dry, uh, the dry by day, dry by night, all those things only, and whether the child is able to uh, say about his bowel needs, that's what we need from this. We we also do know that there, there won't be any history of autonomic system. So you can just like that omit. Okay, okay. Yeah. next, next. Again, uh, you can say, mother, uh, uh, when I asked the mother, well, there was no history of any smallness or or uh, large head noticed by the mother. Okay. That's what you have to say for a micro or macro cephaly. And yeah. there was a history of swelling, so you have explained all those things. Very good. Next. And apart from that, history of comorbidities, you can't bring history of bed sore, history of callosity, that and all will not come as a history. Those okay. things will have to be told in the examination. The comorbidities, what are the comorbidities you expect in a child with a cerebral palsy? Cognitive impairment, vision, speech, hearing, defect. Ah, starting from your intellectual disability, seizures, uh, then 
vision, speech, mm. hearing, mm. presence of any contractures, mm. uh, bladder bubble uh, difficulties, mm. um, mm. uh, behavioral disturbances. Mm. What is the behavioral disturbances? So that's what important. Whether there has uh, there was any history of sleeping difficulty, whether there are any associated behavioral disturbances, whether the constipation is very important, you have mentioned. Okay. So otherwise, no history of bed sore, no history of callosity, those things and all feeding difficulty you have told. That is very important. History of recurrent respiratory tract infection, ear infection, and all very important. And gaining weight or failure to thrive, all those things are very important. So other things you have to omit. You cannot bring everything into the history. Okay. This and all will not be, uh, it will not uh, hold sense. Okay. So okay. those things you have to omit. Uh, next. And again, etiological history and all like this, uh, I think uh, you can say there was no history of abnormal odor of urine. Because why immediately I will be asking you why you have asked that history. Here is a baby you, uh, who is a preterm who had a definite history of birth asphyxia, was admitted, had seizures on day one itself. So everything is going, uh, going in favor of a birth asphyxia. Again, a preterm, we know the pretty well, what are the complications of the preterm and this hemorrhage can be, intracranial hemorrhage can be there. In such a case, we, do, is it necessary to ask for history of IEM in this particular baby? Say, you, you say yes or no. Uh, justify your answer. If yes, tell me why yes. If no, why yes? no? It is actually not necessary, ma'am. But one of the DDs for uh, cerebral uh, one of the DDs for cerebral palsy is inborn error of metabolism, ma'am. Unusual order. I asked to rule out finite ketonuria, ma'am. No, yeah, my ma dear. You have to say yes for this uh, for this question yeah. because okay. you had yeah. a previous yeah. sib death. Yeah. Can I? And consanguinity okay, is there as well. It's a yes. very important thing. Okay, Ada. So <laughs> you have to consider that also. Okay. okay. Now the current concept is HIE accounting for uh, CPE is very, very less. The incidence uh, or the proportion of cases with HIE going for this one is very less. All the thing is, the most important thing is, what are the risk factors which uh, predispose the baby to go for birth asphyxia and the newborn period? So it is necessary that we have to look for the risk factors. And here there is a sip death. So it is all the more essential that we have to ask for the IEM history. For that, what you have to say is no history of abnormal odor of urine. Okay. There was no history of any metabolic, say, suggestive of metabolic decompensation during episodes of fever or intercurrent infection. Child did not have any history of vomiting or lethargy, refusal of feeds, uh, got admitted like that. No history of previous hospitalization. Okay. Then no history of abnormal startle. For what we have to ask that question, Dhamma? Abnormal startle. Exaggerated startle response is seen in Tesa. Ah, very good. So it is an excessive acoustic phenomena. So uh, which is equivalent to your startle reflex. So that can be, if the it is so, then there are some differential diagnosis which could be considered in this particular case. Okay, that you have to say. And then uh, no history suggestive of genetic problem, dysmorphic phases, congenital anomalies. No, my dear. And no history suggestive of hypothyroidism. I don't think no history suggestive of prothrombotic conditions. This and all you have to avoid. Okay, okay. Adama. Right. Next. Yes, ma'am. Ma yes, madam. Uh, I want to say something. Yes. Yes, put that previous slide, Madhav Sundari. Yes, uh, actually, you know, whenever you are presenting in uh, examination, uh, whatever case uh, you are going to have present, you know the diagnosis. So all the case history and everything should be tailor-made. And if it is needed, you can uh, write and you can present. Otherwise, if the examiner asks if there are any other condition, then you can uh, elaborately say other conditions also there. Otherwise, no, you will be trapping yourself for more questions. So you can know everything, but you need not say everything for that particular case. If it is definitely going to be, for example, this case is going to be a spastic diplegia. And if there is no history of previous preterm delivery and other things. As madam has correctly said, and I also feel that uh, you told a history of intrauterine uh, infection. And uh, this uh, HIV and uh, genital herpes, no, I think we have missed that. That is also very important uh, when you say the etiological history. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as madam has correctly told that prothrombotic conditions, no, that will be important if you are having a case of hemiplegic HIV. <laughs> Otherwise, no, you need not mention that you know it. If the examiner asks you a question, 
that is in the exam point of view so madam and sir are saying in the uh, uh, context of both the clinical usage and even you know, practice and other thing but exam point of view these are all the things very very important okay yes you can proceed, proceed. this is quite good uh, i'm just one the intrauterine infection uh, like the way it was uh, mentioned you could take it take it anyway but you can always take it as that was some kind of an infection which triggered off the premature delivery as well not essential intrauterine infection for the baby so just a mom could have had an infection which at that time could have just triggered off the thing so that could have been taken that way and uh, remember ma whenever you say something you can always justify it that's what madam was giving you a chance in saying like is there any point that you can because there is a consanguinity there so that is always something which you can always add in there and say yes there is a consanguinous marriage and that's why i was considering this and you can always put that point in and when it comes to iem very often you will have some kind of a deterioration in the middle there will be a decompensation and there will be a deterioration or a regression and then picking back up and uh, that kind of uh, life threatening episodes are happening with severe acidosis uh, hypoglycemia or they can just have a deterioration where they are just admitted to hospital being so unwell and then they gradually pick up and never back to the same weight so when you have those kind of things and immediately comes to yes there is an iem but when whenever you have consanguinity you can always say this and even if you have a spastic diplegia you can always say there are so many genetic conditions which can also present with the diplegia like appearance you can have uh, similar patterns of uh, uh, the appearance in the leg as well as you can see pvl pattern so uh, there are quite a few genes which are uh, now been recognized col 4 a1 and uh, all those so you can always use those things so just be aware of some of those differential diagnoses for spastic diplegia that is very very important and there are some very nice articles on uh, differential diagnoses for cerebral palsy and particularly looking at some of those genetic ones and how to differentiate them uh, one of the other interesting things i usually come across is when it comes to examination you mentioned about uh, um, spasticity uh, being picked up quite early uh, how early do you think uh, spasticity is noted in cerebral palsy say diplegia spastic diplegia how often do you really see the parents to notice the spasticity the tightness yes sir the parents usually note the spasticity in diplegia sir most common presentation is spasticity sir in diplegia as the intelligence is quite normal in, in spastic diplegia as uh, increased tone will be the main presentation sir so when do you notice that ma very often when do the parents when notice child, when the child starts uh, around 1 year of age and uh, like when the child starts crawling or when the child is uh, going to stand sir say if someone notices some kind of uh, increased tone before 6 months what would you think of like very early on they are saying like how oh, i am seeing a lot of this kind of dystonia mm so just something to remember man neurotransmitter disorders is where you will present so early with uh, um the tone changes with dystonia and uh, spasticity so whenever you have that very very early on think very carefully usually diplegia that presentation is after one year before that they'll be quite floppy and then they suddenly you see the gradually the tone is increasing after about 9 months you'll gradually increase but one year is when they will usually recognize it. okay so sorry i've just uh, something comes to my mind i was just uh, want to quickly go through that carry on ma next slide please what is the summary dama Hmm. Three years old child, girl child, second born of third degree consanguineous marriage, significant perinatal history of preterm delivery, not tried at birth, neonatal seizure, ventilated for one week, CDC for two weeks, with a midline swelling in the back, probably meningocele. It was operated at one and a half year, with uh, with the global developmental delay, predominantly motor developmental delay, with treatment of all four limbs, which improved with physiotherapy. Hmm. Uh, but that summary, you want to give a diagnosis of spastic diplegia, my dear? Uh, 
because of the increased tone and uh, so i have to confirm my uh, diagnosis um, confirm it in uh, confirm this with clinical examination and uh, then you got to say predominantly this child uh, 3 year old with a predominant motor delay with a stiffness of uh, all four limbs more so in the lower limbs yes ma'am parents have noticed more in the lower limbs so you know you have told in the pre present illness itself so yes, more so in the lower limbs okay. what are the other things which are present or not present history wise uh, the child is having no history is suggestive of uh, uh, scissoring of both the lower limbs history of difficulty in uh, cleaning the perineum and all okay. yes, what else is there Uh, as a child is not walking without not any history without any history of any history suggestive of cranial involvement without any uh, other uh, history of uh, uh, extra pyramidal involvement or cerebellar involvement no other comorbidities associated good and what about the history of uh, uh, swelling in the back in the uh, lumbosacral region which was operated at one year of age mm -hmm. okay Okay. with this uh, uh, history what is your impression uh, it is a case of uh, global developmental delay predominantly motor developmental delay mm. uh, uh, with the uh, with the, no other uh, gross comorbidities ma'am good mm. without any other comorbidities mm. Uh, probably a case of uh, as it is a developmental delay probably a case of cerebral palsy as there was also many was here probably a neural tube defect associated uh, the cause uh, probably being preterm or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy okay okay we will discuss about this diagnosis later after the examination go ahead with the examination yes ma'am general examination the child is conscious comfortable at rest posture in supine position shoulder adducted elbow extended wrist palm flexion is present hip flexed adducted knee flexion is present ankle plantar flex and everted right more than left the child is not active sleep or dyspnea interacted interested in surroundings no behavioral abnormalities no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing edema or lymphadenopathy uh, vital pulse rate uh, 92 per minute regular in rhythm normal in volume no radio radial or radio femoral delay respiratory 24 per minute stop abdominal respiration bp 90 per 15 right upper limb in sitting position temperature 90 to 98.5 This is the image of the child in supine and in standing. The mother, the child was uh, not able to stand without support. This is the image uh, with mother holding the baby and uh, making to stand the baby with support. Anthropometry uh, height eighty eight centimeter observed against the expected ninety five centimeter comes under zero to minus two standard deviation. Eighteen kg ten ten point seven kg expected fourteen kg standard deviation of zero to minus two standard deviation. Weight for age seventy six percent, grade one PEM. Height for age ninety two percent, normal for age. Weight for height minus one to minus two standard deviation. Head circumference forty seven centimeter, zero to minus one standard deviation. Mid arm circumference of fourteen centimeter, normal for age. Uh, these are the WHO growth charts. I have plotted it. Um, coming to head to foot examination, skin BCG scar is present. No neurocutaneous marker. Shape of the skull is normal. Size is normal. AF and PF close. Hair normal. Face no dysmorphic face is present. Uh, no cataract. Twin process. Nystagmus. No tendon dysplasia. No signs of vitamin A deficiency. Ear no discharge is present. Mouth no oral thrush. No cleft lip palate. No dental caries. Tongue normal. Neck is normal. Chest and abdomen normal. In spine surgical scar seen over the uh, lumbar region. Defect uh, can be felt uh, in uh, behind uh, beneath the scar region. Limbs contraction of the ankle present. No bed sore. No callosity. No feeding need. Seen as examination, higher functions, alert, oriented, speech and language normal, interested in surroundings, gait could not be assessed and memory could not be assessed. Brain in nerve examination, one uh, first nerve examination, able to perceive smell. Uh, second nerve visual acuity, able to fix and follow objects. Field of vision is normal. Color vision could not be tested. Pupillary light reflex is direct and indirect light reflex plus accommodation reflex plus and fundus is normal. Uh, Already so examined is uh, field of vision. Confrontation uh, test, ma'am. Less than. I could understand. Yes, ma'am. Child could understand, ma'am. Less than. Comprehension years, is good. Yes, ma'am. Comprehension is good, ma'am. Proceed. Third, fourth, and sixth now. B O M full. No torsus, nystagmus, or squint. Fifth uh, now, able to chew well. Sensation over face normal. Corneal and conjunctival reflexes plus. Jaw jacket plus. 
Seventh, now blinking of forehead press, able to close eyes tightly, no deviation of angle of mouth, no obliteration of nasolabial pores, able to blow, sensation over anterior two third of the tongue is normal, cornea and conjunctival reflexes plus. Eighth, now turns head to sound and noise. Ninth and tenth, now uvula midline, gag reflex was present, parietal movements equal on both sides during crying. Eleventh, uh, now able to turn head side to side. Twelfth, now sub midline, no deviation of fasciculation, no wasting. Motor system examination, posture, inscupine position. Again, my dear, did you examine uh, taste and all for this child? Um, As madam has told you, uh, if it is normal, kindly skip those things. Don't uh, uh, get into problems. Yes, madam has advised you already. Okay. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. If you have not done, don't say. There is no facial asymmetry. That's what we want. Is it okay. not? Do you expect? Uh, what are the cranial nerves you will concentrate in a child with a developmental delay or with a CP ma? Uh, second, second, third, mm. second now, third, fourth, mm. fifth now, mm. uh, seventh mm. now involvement. Uh, seventh now involvement. What, what, what seventh now involvement? Uh, hemiplegic CP. Hemiplegic CP. How many semi hemiplegic CPs you have seen? Uh, Do you have any uh, associated seventh now palsy in a hemiplegic CP? Otherwise called a congenital hemiplegia. Uh, no, ma'am. No. In fact, it was the it it is one of the distinguishing features between a congenital hemiplegia, uh, otherwise called a hemiplegic CP, and an acquired hemiplegia. For whatever reasons we do not know that this uh, associated human facial lag will not be there in a congenital hemiplegia, my dear. Yes, so don't say seventh nerve at all. Second okay. nerve, yes. Third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve, yes. Because Nine. for the squint, okay. Yes. And then uh, what kind of type of squint do you usually have in a CP? Non-paralytic squint. Non-paralytic squint, good. Second now, why did you ask about second now? Sir, well, Murugan sir was already asking you about second now. Yalir itself. And the early part of the discussion itself. Uh, yes, uh, These children can have, CP children can have visual difficulties. What could be the cause for the visual difficulty in these children? You said this already, you didn't mention it, ma'am. It could be either due to optic atrophy or due to cortical blindness. Okay. That's why we are looking at the, and it is one of the special senses which we have to, and it is one of the. Uh, comorbidity also associated with the CP. That's why we have to concentrate on the second now. Third, fourth, sixth cranial now for squint. The normally what we have is an only a non-paralytic squint or a concomitant squint. Okay, yeah. Next. Ninth, tenth. Uh, eighth now, deafness. Uh, yes, so eighth now also we have to concentrate. And then feeding difficulties for that ninth, tenth cranial nerves. Other things we don't usually, we do not have any, any problem with the other cranial nerves. Okay, okay. so you can you have to mention about there are no uh, vision, the child is fixing and following light in all directions. Okay. And then uh, extraocular movements are full. There is no nystagmus or squint. And then there is no facial asymmetry. Uh, child is able to hear normally. Then immediately I will be asking uh, you, how did you test uh, hearing in this particular child? Um, there are eight specific uh, tests for hearing now. Uh, less than one year, Vera is the best. Papa, I am not asking you the theory. In this particular child, how did you? Um, uh, by visual reinforcement test, ma'am. Okay, what did you do? So Tell me. Hearing just by, uh, if the child is able, I, I pr produce a sound, ma'am, just if the child is able to turn to the side of sound uh, mm. or lo localize to the side of sound, ma'am. Mm. Just by that, uh, that uh, the child is not having any hearing system. The okay. child is able to uh, understand, comprehend and respond. Good. Turn to the source of the sound. And then child is able to comprehend and uh, whatever you are asking, the child is able to comprehend well and the child is responding to your commands. Is it not? Yes, ma'am. And if the child is, uh, how old is the child? Three years, ma'am. Three years, okay. So if the child is uh, uh, more than... Uh, uh, did you, uh, uh, can you do this uh, tuning fork test? Uh, no, ma'am. The child is uh, not cooperative for tuning fork test, ma'am. Mm. Uh, it is usually done about five years of age. Good, good. Okay. This is what we will be asking you in the exams. How did you do this and that? Okay. okay. Right. Go ahead. Bulk uh, equal on both sides. No visible wasting. No limb length discrepancies. Tone, upper limb tone normal. Again, again. You, you are inviting trouble. Do, do you expect a limb length discrepancy in this particular child? Hemiplegic no, child, you have to say. Yes, okay. Yes, Similarly, uh, uh, will there be any wasting? Uh, no, no wasting. No wasting. So, bulk you can say normal. 
yes, if ma'am. the child is uh, some child you can say you uh, diffuse thinning of the muscles like that okay or else you say just bulk normally in all four limbs hmm. okay ma'am hmm. um, sorry this on this you can say probably equal because there can be some degree of a uh, uh, wasting in uh, muscles particularly when it is not being used adequately when they have that um i don't know if you take it at the sense of uh, wasting uh, which would be a uh, um, lower motor neuron lesion type wasting to like where there will be some kind of uh, asymmetry then that is not what we will see but you will have some kind of um, uh, muscles not being used properly even with spasticity the muscle bulk will definitely be smaller but you won't see a discrepancy between the sides can i proceed to the next next slide Uh, mm-hmm. just one other thing about the spine which you had mentioned in the previous slide or the previous one when you talk about the spine and you say the like there are so many things which you are mentioning about but in spine you are just seeing about the surgical scar um is it appropriate to look at uh, kyphoscoliosis at that point to see if there is anything obvious there at that point ma'am or uh, is there yes, something sir, yes, sir, definitely, definitely yes sir because when you see any abnormality in the spine it's a very important thing always to mention that no kyphoscoliosis is probably very very important at this point uh, i don't know whether it is this or you do an examination specifically for that later but uh, whenever is, this is a very very important negative uh, thing to mention you have to include that rakana hmm. yes ma'am yes ma'am hmm. can i proceed uh, hmm. sorry on similarly you have told a no feeding aids similarly you have to say whether the child is having any splint or whether the child is on a wheelchair like that okay yes, child is a diplegic child whether the child is wearing any uh, any uh, splint or yes, shoes sir. like that okay hmm. any peripheral getting... aids any peripheral aids the child is using okay ma'am hmm. yes Um, the tone is increased in the upper limb, right and left side. Lower limb, uh, lower limb, the tone is increased. Power, best absorbed power. Short and again, tone. tone is increased. Is uh, we have to be specific. Then we have to ask whether it was a spasticity, whether it was a spasticity or a rigidity. Then we will be asking what are the differences between spasticity and rigidity. So whenever you are telling itself, you say that is spasticity of both the lower limbs present. Okay. Ma'am. Okay. Mm. Spasticity of both lower limbs mm. present. Power, best absorbed power, shoulder joint, adductor right and left four by five, uh, abductor right and left four by five, flexor four by five, extensor four by five, with elbow joint four by five, wrist joint four by five, hip joint, uh, hand grip is good both sides, hip joint, um, the child is able to move only eliminating gravity, abductor two by five, adductor two by five, flexor two by five, and extensor two by five, knee joint two by five, and ankle joint two by five. How many grades of power are there? Uh, zero to uh, from uh, starting from zero, uh, then up to four grades are present, ma'am. Uh, uh, zero, there is no movement at all. One. Flicker How many grades of power are there? Five grades, ma'am. Answer is six, including zero. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Hmm. Uh, should should I say the grade? What is that grading is called? MRC grading, ma'am. Medical Research Council grading. Good. Proceed. Uh, reflexes superficial reflexes corneal conjunctival and again uh, again in the lower limbs you have said it is uh, is it uniformly all the muscle groups are 2 by 5 that's what sir was asking initially which group of muscles are more involved there is something called pyramidal weakness okay okay ma'am uh, uh, some people may be asking you this question you have told about the tone flexors of the upper limb and extensors of the lower limb that is for tone so there is something called pyramidal Uh, type of weakness you just remember the posture a hemiplegic person will assume in the upper limb as well as in the lower limb and opposite groups of muscles are weak that's all suppose okay, the ma'am. upper limb is adducted at the shoulder then abductors are weak okay ma'am uh, uh, it is flexed at the elbow then it is the extensors are weak it is flexed at the uh, wrist then the wrist extensors are weak Okay. the fingers are flexed then the finger extensors are weak similarly you have to just remember the posture the patient will assume think about a uh, hemiplegic uh, person then you say the opposite groups of muscles are weak that is called the pyramidal weakness okay, okay. Mm. but here when you say 2 by 5 
that just simply means uh, only with gravity eliminate that this is possible. But if you look at it, it's very unusual to have a power of 2 by 5 in spastic diplegia. As soon as you say the power is 2 by 5 in the lower limbs, now you are really putting yourself into a position to say that this is more likely to be a spinal cord involvement. If you have a significant weakness to this degree, you will never get, uh, like I've never seen a, um, a diplegia with such degree of weakness. The child is able to walk with support now, my dear? Well, it's able to stand up, ma'am. Stand with support, ma'am. The child yeah. is not able to uh, walk, ma'am. Yeah, but standing up with support, the most of these uh, groups would be coming into action. And without mm -hmm. that, like, unless you have movements against gravity, you won't be able to stand. Probably you have to examine the child in various positions, like supine position, sitting on a stool or sitting at the bed of the, uh, at the corner of the bed and ask the child to move the uh, knee joints, uh, legs to and fro and the exam and say, whether the whether the power is three or not okay, okay. Mm. similarly my dear similarly uh, you said that there is a son uh, tendo achilles contracture on both sides in the general examination itself mm -hmm. so there will be a difference in the power between the darcy flexors and the plantar flexors of the foot so we have to remember all those things okay we cannot just like that blanketly we have we can say that is two by five in all the groups of muscles in both alloy limbs that's what that's what sir says okay palatal and pharyngeal so superficial okay. reflexes include those also okay, okay. Good. Yes, you have uh, examined the abdominal reflex. I appreciate you. Mm. Uh, deep tendon reflexes, jaw jerk plus, biceps uh, was present, triceps present, supinator also present, knee jerk uh, 3 plus, ankle jerk 3 plus. Mm. Uh, Mauta system, ankle clone is absent, satellite clone is absent, primitive reflexes, routing absent, tucking absent, asymmetric chronic neck reflex absent, moro absent, plantar, uh, plantar grasp was present. Uh, this is the video of the child. The child is having uh, almost normal movements of the upper limb with normal tone now, and the grip is also good for this baby. Is there any asymmetry, any asymmetry between the left and the right? The child is preferring the left upper limb. Does it not? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, the hand reference is left, left ma'am, but there is no asymmetry between both. Okay. But the child is preferring? Yes, preferring left, left side. side. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. But on examination, you find any, uh, you don't find any asymmetry in the spasticity or in the or in the power no, nothing no okay. good hmm. proceed i should uh, can i play the video of the reflexes elicited ma'am hmm. What do you look for when you elicit the knee jerk? Knee jerk time is from hamstring contraction. Good. Similarly, when you elicit the Babinski, uh, that is your uh, plantar reflex, you have to fix the ankle. You can uh, do a little bit of uh, flex the uh, knee joint also on the fix the ankle and then with the key, you have to slowly do it. And you should uh, you should uh, come from the solar aspect, uh, from the sole in the lateral aspect of the sole, then across the metatarsals, head of metatarsals, up to only fourth finger you can come and as as you have showed when you get a response then you have to stop with that you can, you should not proceed further yes, yes. Mm. you are you are uh, you are eliciting a little faster uh, but uh, you should do it slowly okay mm. and uh, when you hold the knee hammer ma always hold mm -hmm. it at the end that uh, like you are using the right knee hammer which i am very very pleased about and then uh, when you use it, you hold it from the end and then you can, you should be able to feel the uh, hammer move through. And when you do it that way, it comes out quite nicely. And be very careful when you use the key or so, the child should not be hurt or if the child feels any pain will not cooperate after that. So it's okay. very, very important that you are very careful about it. Now, just, just show this um, uh, biceps jerk again. 
the biceps and the supinator jerk. Can you show that again, ma? Yes, sir. See, one of the important things that you should do when you do the biceps jerk. Yeah. Um, so one of the things you look at is not just the flexion of the elbows, it is also the palm flexion of the fingers. So that is also something you should be looking for. So if you're taking a video, that also should be covered very clearly. So and that is something you should look out for. Sometimes very, very subtle, you will just see the finger as fingers alone uh, flexing, even for biceps. So that's just Something for you to remember, ma. Okay, sir. Okay. And don't keep tapping again and again. Just one tap. Put your hand in there. Put your finger in there. And then it should be like this. And then you tap on it very quickly. One. Then they will absolutely be fine. And this is just more a, a thing when children are being scared um, that you are tapping. Make a sound along with it. This is more my personal experience. When you make a sound along with it, saying like a doom or so, they're very interested in that sound. And even if that hurts a little bit, they will not bother about it because their sensory thing is concentrating on the sound you are making. But you need to, although you make the sound, you need to watch very carefully about the movements. Okay. This is more just practical advice rather than anything. Yes, little surprised because you said the, the reflexes are exaggerated in the lower limbs uh, but uh, there is no ankle clonus yes, because of the con okay. you don't expect a petalar clonus petalar clonus will not be there definitely okay. but ankle clonus may be there but uh, uh, probably due to contracture you are telling mm -hmm. okay mm. but the other thing about uh, clonus is always ask the parents ma, because very mm -hmm. often they will describe clonus beautifully ask them sometimes you won't elicit it and if you ask the parents uh, do you see this kind of jerking of the ankle they will clearly tell you yes okay. and if they tell you yes it is there it's just a matter of time you just have to keep repeating it two or three times within that uh, 15 to 20 minutes you will get it okay. if you have two darcy flex ankle then you will not be uh, able to elicit it so okay. As Sir has pointed out, uh, if you try it again, then you may be getting. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. Touch pain, pressure, temperature normal, joint position, vibration could not be assessed, cortical sensation could not be assessed in this way. Cerebral lump, no hypotonia, speech defect, intentional trauma, no nystagmus, incoordination, involuntary movement, finger nose test, finger finger nose test, this area of inertia could not be assessed in this way. Extra pyramidal system, no involuntary movement, fine and cranium. Just one, just one minute, ma. Uh, when you talk about cerebellum, uh, when you say finger nose test, you can't do it. See, a three year old, you cannot ask them to do exactly a finger nose test and they won't do it. Yes, how, how do you, what else can you do to just see? Um, you have to assess the coordination still. You can't just say no in coordination, but that is something you should have said, like I did assess it this way and then found it. What can you do? A simple thing for them to do? They, the child was able to walk, could be No, like, Sarah is asking about what, how do you elicit coordination or how do you examine co for coordination in this check? Uh, by, giving, uh, uh, by giving a toy or asking the... Uh, By giving a toy and uh, um, and how he how the child approaches for the toy or for the object with that you can what else buttoning unbuttoning or or uh, 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 what is that opening the uh, uh, cap of a water bottle like that you can that's what you have to do in small children and uh, in uh, such a child. Okay. Yes. And the involuntary movements, how did you look for it, ma'am? Um, uh, intentional tremors, sir. When the, the child is uh, asked to take something, there is no tremors. Uh, this child is quite smart one. And uh, you can look for, ask them to just stretch their hands out. They will very happily do that. This is something even a younger child, if you ask them to do it, they will happily put their hands out. Yes, sir. 
and uh, the, that is when you are most likely to see any form of uh, involuntary movements it will become quite obvious when you ask them to put their hand out they can close their eyes even better okay sir but all these children will be like particularly the ones you are describing three year old who is quite bright with good speech and language to so ask them to put their hand out and if you do it in front of them they will be very happy to do that okay go on ma'am no in uh, except from the system no involuntary movement spinal cranium the cranium was normal uh, spine there is no kyphoscoliosis present spina bifida was present on palpation no signs of meningeal irritation examination of other systems respiratory system bilateral air entry plus normal vesicular breathsorts were present no added sound cardiovascular system s1 s2 was present no murmur abdomen was soft lungs free with bowel sounds present Uh, coming to the summary, three years old girl child, second born of third degree consanguineous marriage, the significant perinatal history of birth and six years, preterm delivery, neonatal seizures, uh, neurotypical meningosis, presenting with global developmental delay, predominantly motor delay, improved with physiotherapy and speech therapy. Now a predominantly motor developmental delay, uh, which is a static encephalopathy with passivity of all four limbs. Uh, exaggerated with exaggerated depend on reflexes with bilateral ankle contracture and meningosis opposite uh, can i proceed with the diagnosis sir diagnosis this is a case of uh, cerebral palsy which is a static encephalopathy spastic diplegia with bilateral ankle contracture and meningosis the probable etiology be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy on pre maturity with functional classification 3 normal nutrition no vision or hearing defect no constipation but so no involuntary movement no behavior disturbance previous slide draw karna previous hmm. examination reveals examination uh, reveals uh, spasticity of cognition normal or uh, 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 cognition is normal ma'am Cognition is normal. No cranial nerves involved. Uh, uh, so, what do you have to say? Examination revealed. Uh, examination revealed. Uh, normal mm. cognition. No cranial nerve involvement. First of uh, all, positive findings, and then uh, the other findings. Okay. okay. So, uh, with, uh, whether it is a spastic quadriplegic or not? No, ma'am. Hmm. Um, cognition is it is a spastic diplegia ma'am quadriparis uh, the neck and uh, other trunk whether there is any uh, whether there is any weakness in the upper limbs or not no ma'am no weakness at present ma'am uh, only lower limbs are involved but spasticity is there in all four limbs uh, now with physiotherapy the child is not having spasticity ma'am the tone is almost normal in the upper limbs but uh, the okay. child but the reflexes are brisk on the upper limbs is it not Are almost normal in the upper limbs, ma'am. Lower limbs is exaggerated, ma'am. Really appreciate your uh, um, strong belief in physiotherapy, which can uh, completely relieve the child's spasticity in the upper limb, which almost never happens. I can tell you that. Uh, hope there's no physiotherapist in the meeting, but uh, you cannot uh, cure things with physiotherapy. Physiotherapy helps definitely, but uh, it does not make things better. it cannot uh, like uh, a deep turn reflexes cannot be made uh, normal by physiotherapy you should remember that nerves are nerves and it will hold their uh, whatever you are and whomever you are and whatever you do with that so that's something to remember um, so what you have to say is spastic, uh, spastic quadriparesis but the lower limbs are more involved with involvement of more uh, more involvement of lower limbs than the upper limbs with uh, Uh, exaggerated DTR with the plantar extensor or bilateral plantar extensor without any involuntary movements or in coordination with an intact cranial nerves and normal cognition with the a scar operated scar in the back. Okay, with the bilateral ankle contracture. So now you have to say because. whenever you say uh, say the final uh, what is your final diagnosis it should be a complete one number one and number two for each word you are uttering in the diagnosis there should be some justification in the in the clinical examination now your diagnosis complete diagnosis next slide cerebral palsy spastic diplegia with bilateral ankle contraction and meningosis 
So when you say spastic diplegia, then you should be able to tell us in the previous previous line. You you should have told us spastic quadriparesis, but the lower limbs are more involved than the upper limbs. Number one, okay? Contracture. Ah. Uh. When you go see the operator, operator. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Operator. ஜஸ்ட்ஸ் <laughs> uh developmental domains uh, i'll come back to this but developmental domains can you just tell me the domains or oh, you don't have to go back you can just tell me ma don't go back it's okay yes sir gross motor fine motor social language um activity uh, social language vision hearing cognition activities of daily living like bladder and bowel right so see whenever you go into the domains there are certain things which go with certain other things so when you say gross motor yes gross motor but fine motor goes with vision yes sir okay when you say fine motor you say vision along with okay sir hmm? so similarly speech and language and hearing go together okay sir so when you put them together whenever you mention that as a domain together that makes sense and then social of course okay, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. so like always put them together fine motor and vision because if you have vision problems the fine motor pro- problems will also be there so similarly if you have speech and language issues you the first thing you need to look at is hearing yes, and if there is fine motor you should be looking at vision because without mentioning vision you cannot say that there is a problem with the fine motor function they would expect you to be able to mention those two so that's why don't put that separately because when you are anxious you might forget to mention it but uh, the way i have been taught is gross motor fine motor vision speech and language and hearing and social so that's how i have always gone so just for you to remember it just something to come out easily um see the, when you put in all those things then uh, saying the weakness which you found 2 by 5 will not fit into the diagnosis now if someone comes back to ask you that question what would you answer how would you answer that because you particularly put power of 2 by 5 in the lower limbs and upper limb is uh, 4 by 5 yes ma'am so that is something you should really think very carefully when you mention uh, something like that in the because they can go back and ask you that specific question and um, you should be able to answer that and so you need to be very careful about what you mention that you could say the lower limb is probably slightly weaker than the upper limb but when you give a specific score like that particularly when you say 2 by 5 that will definitely be picked up hmm? so be very careful when you mention that okay okay um uh, that's my side ma'am sorry uh, why do you say, uh, your uh, diagnosis is cerebral palsy why do you say it is a cerebral palsy the global developmental delay more of motor uh, domain involvement uh, presence of primitive reflexes uh, pres- there were no presence of uh, all the primitive reflexes were absent so just one man they mentioned Prasen. one that's why yes. <laughs> crash or something child is reaching for objects no yes ma'am uh, then how uh, then how come the palmar grasp is still present palmar grasp is absent and plantar grasp is present ma'am. i see okay uh, delay development of the postural reflexes abnormal uh, presence of abnormal reflexes modern media kanna first of all you have to say non progressive is it not it's a yes, static ma'am. in the slide you have put it as static encephalopathy okay. but when i ask you you should say that is the first one okay mm-hmm. there is a history of developmental delay number 2 it is non progressive or static or with the physiotherapy it is improving if it is a progressive one you will not make a diagnosis of cerebral palsy is it not mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. then there is a pathological tone of normal that there is a tone cp is defined as a defined cp cerebral palsy is defined as a non progressive disorder of posture movement and tone 
uh, due to that uh, lesion in the growing brain that can be in the fetal early infancy or in the childhood period in the early childhood period though it is a static encephalopathy it affects our dynamic because of the plasticity of the oh, growing it is an insult to the growing uh, brain okay yes. so initial part of it you said that, that is a static disorder of disorder of posture movement and tone yeah so here is a child with a pathological tone or tone abnormality or pathological tone namely spasticity and you have evidence of pyramidal involvement as uh, as evidenced by your uh, increased spasticity exaggerated dtr and plantar extensor okay so that is for spasticity but here here is an uh, uh, pathological tone abnormalities similarly abnormal reflexes or pathological reflexes and it is a non progressive lesion and there is a developmental delay because of all these features and there is no agonomegaly or there is no progression or there is no regression of the milestones so this is a case of cerebral palsy okay so these are the reasons you have to put forward whenever uh, whenever uh, it is asked it is uh, whenever they ask you why do you say it is a cerebral palsy okay right uh, whether uh, do you need any uh, investigations to diagnose cerebral palsy diagnosis of cerebral palsy is mostly clinical ma'am uh, is clinical, clinical mostly illa. it is it's clinical, clinical. Yes, it is clinical okay yes, suppose this child is walking will you call it as a cpda yes ma'am the child can walk ma'am <laughs> see the diagnosis is clinical number 1 and depends upon the motor disability dakanna okay mm -hmm. it depends on the motor disability so suppose somebody is having so, so many children see neurocutaneous syndromes can have uh, developmental delay there are so many other causes for developmental delay but if there is no motor disability they are able to walk run and all you will not call it as a cerebral palsy dakana okay okay yes, so the diagnosis is clinical and depends upon the motor disability the child is having okay uh, you don't need any clinical or sorry uh, any investigation to diagnose cp then what do you then why do you do investigations investigation is done to rule out uh, the other to uh, identify the etiology okay to identify the cause or etiology now uh, you are uh, your friends can answer i think what are the investigations you are planning my dear and how do you investigate this child Basic investigations to. Uh, so, everyone, you can answer. Yes, oh, you have written. Basic, you have put a slide for that also. Okay. Basic investigations such as complete blood count, fetal smear, and urine culture. Now, new imaging like uh, MRI, tandem mass spectro uh, spectroscopy to rule out uh, IEM disorders. Now. Development screening and assessment screening. Madam, you yeah. ask questions, madam. Madam, Anandi, ma'am, you ask. Anandi, madam, unmute. Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. As madam has correctly said, no, that uh, investigations may not benefit the. CP child. It's, if at all any investigation that will benefit a CP child will be what this it can be. Yeah, this child doesn't even need that. Yeah. Imaging modality like MRI. Yeah, that will uh, help you to make a etiological diagnosis. That might not help the child, you know, benefiting the child, but this child may not even need that. Any seizure, but to no, no, for a, for only now EEG can sometimes it might other investigation just know we will be finding out the ETLG as madam has correctly said and of all the diagnostic things know the more important things can be you know developmental screening test and assessment test which will benefit the child so that is an integral part though we don't call them as investigation it should be done to screen any child with a developmental delay so that might help the child for the functional classification and also for their 
training in future and also for the physiotherapy to which they should be subjected. As uh, uh, PG students, you should know some of the screening tests and some of the assessment tests. And you should also know what is an assessment test and what is a screening test. There is a difference between them. Okay. For exam point of view, as uh, some of the uh, tests that is you know, purely by made by Indian doctors. And then as you, uh, in between, you made a mention of uh, that uh, gross motor functional GMFCS. So you slightly said that we couldn't hear that at all. Okay. Yes. Now you can say the developmental screening test. What are the developmental screening tests available? You can answer them. You need not put a slide. If you're having a slide, put it. Having made it, you put it. Yes. I can I ask one quick one about cardiac uh, serum lactate and CK levels and TMS? When would you do them? Like in this uh, yes, slide, put it. Why yes. would you even consider? In mitochondrial disorders, uh, serum lactate or uh, uh, CPK levels uh, would be required, sir. And TMS for arginine deficiency, uh, which can be manifest like spastic diplegia. Sorry, Tima. Which one? Argin arginine deficiency, which can manifest like spastic diplegia, sir. Yeah. But, yeah. But when would you go for cardiac uh, serum lactate C cables like waiting for mitochondrial? PMS, you are looking at Sorry, Can you not hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Say in this scenario, if the MRI scan is normal, what would you do? But you have an MRI which is normal. What would you do at that point? Next is uh, screening for inborn error of metabolism. Good. Yeah. I would refer to someone like Dr. Prabhima Paulin or so. That's what you should say very quickly. Um, because in that scenario, you are looking at inborn errors of metabolism as well as uh, genetic disorders. So that's what is very important that we should be able to remember. So the MRI scan, there will always be a typical pattern to the type of uh, uh, motor dysfunction you are seeing. So uh, do not mention cardiac serum lactate, CK levels, TMS straight away. But if you see something like in an MRI, which is normal or a very specific pattern of bilateral basal ganglia involvement, something like that, then you are going to change that completely. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. I just want to ask one quick question about uh, the motor uh, spasticity you had mentioned. Do you know what is dystonia? Do you come across dystonia in spastic diplegia? Spastic diplegia, dystonia is not common, sir. In this kinetic type of CT, dystonia is common. Dystonia is uh, uh, you, uh, that is coordination between the gravity and anti gravity muscles is not proper, and so there is uh, sustained muscle uh, contraction of a particular muscle group. Sir. So, use the word co contraction for that. You described it in detail. In one word, you say that's co contraction. Yes, okay, yes, both the uh, both the group of muscles are contracting at the same time, and you get into different postures. And uh, the important thing to look at is diplegia, you will have a lot of them, like clinically, because I see a lot of children clinically, you will see a lot of them do have uh, dystonia. Mm -hmm. And how do you get dystonia? Like when you examine the child, you will have an increased tone. But how will you know whether this child has got dystonia or not? Is there any way of checking that? See, when you examine the child's tone is increased, so you write it as spasticity. And then another person goes and examines and says, no, the child's tone is normal or slightly on the lower side. Between spasticity and dystonia. Uh, spasticity is velocity dependent as in uh, as dystonia is velocity independent. Uh -huh. uh, tone will be increased during stimulation and decreased during sleep in case of dystonia where it remains same in spasticity. What would you do? Just ask the parents. The parents will very clearly tell you that they when you have clear cut spasticity, the tone will remain increased even when the My child sleep. is sleeping. Yes, and uh, if you just have to clarify the dystonia or uh, how much spasticity. So, any child with the cerebral palsy, look at three aspects 
one is spasticity one is dystonia and another is muscle weakness and particularly these kids will have a degree of muscle weakness particularly at the hip so the hip muscle weakness is one of the big contributory factors for their walking and sometimes you work on that this is more clinical ma uh, so those are, i always advise people to look at three aspects one is spasticity one is dystonia and one is muscle weakness if you look at those three aspects it is going to help you clinically which one you are going to deal with okay yeah uh, just proceed through that's fine and in the exam point of view you know uh, pgc should know the timing of investigation various uh, neuro imaging uh, including the point of care ultrasonogram and also you should know what is the finding you expect in the mri i think uh, we are running uh, short of time yeah, i think it is almost more than 9:14 Uh, so i am not uh, giving i uh, expecting answer from you for the mri finding so as pg is of the clinical point of view uh, findings in mri uh, that and the age appropriate testing for vision and hearing so make a note of that prepare notes for that and also the, the various screening tests what you have put uh, because no we have to go for the management says so mainly a clinical condition Uh, to be diagnosed clinically rather than by the investigation and you assess and screen uh, for the therapy of the child yes uh, yes ma'am uh, just ma a point we go to yeah uh, just a, just one point whenever yes, investigations are what do we what will you do and what are the investigations you are planning in such a child then your first test suppose the child has been admitted for some intracranial illness or for breakthrough seizures you can say all those basic investigations and all or else straight away go for say Uh, uh these are the specific investigations i will go for number one is neuroimaging i prefer a mri brain because uh, this is multi uh, multi planar or in uh, in ct scan you can have only on uh, in a single plane or you will not have much information about the posterior fossa you have so many uh, uh, and it is of uh, exposure to radiation so we prefer a mri brain you have to say and then in this particular child since the child had meningocele also the child could have associated uh spinal cord anomalies as well as your ulnar sherry malformation and all because of that i mri brain including spine entire spinal cord would be the ideal neuro imaging for this particular child and what are the uh, then immediately they will ask you as madam has put it what is the uh, finding or what are the uh, findings you are going to expect in such a child so your answer should be since it is a uh, spastic diplegia i will be looking for periventricular leukomalacia very good periventricular leukomalacia and then or sometimes uh, parieta occipital gliosis or uh, or uh, uh, your uh, atrophic changes in the parieta occipital bilateral parieta occipital regions that can also be there okay next thing is arnal cherry malformation you have to look for is there any hydrocephalus or dilated ventricles you have to look for and again in the spinal cord whether there is any tethered cord or diastomatomyelia like that you have to look for that is number one the second investigation you should always say in a children with the cp is a good ophthalmological examination a good ophthalmological examination is very much essential for any child with a developmental delay you should look for is there any squint is there any nystagmus is there any cataract and then uh, whether the fundus is normal or fund, uh, optic atrophy is there chorea retinae is healed chorea retinae is scar then uh, whether there is any rp whether there is any cherry red spot because all these things will provide you a clue to for you to diagnose okay that is number 2 number 3 will be a good hearing evaluation is necessary even though the child is having the child is at the bedside examination reveals that the child is able to hear normally hearing examination is essential then they will be, they will be asking you about oae as well as your uh, brain stem audiometry or uh, aver that also as a post graduates you should know then uh, then apart from that the nas madam has put it uh, your developmental screening and assessment suppose and uh, sir has asked you if these are the expected findings so what you are going to expect in the neuroimaging for this particular child suppose this uh, mri is entirely normal then only you have to look for uh, you have to think about iem and all for this child the child is a preterm child child had a definite history of hie so you are not thinking in terms of iem uh, broadly but however if the mri shows something abnormal then you are not going to proceed if the mri is pretty normal then you will proceed with the tms then in the tms they will be asking you 
for what you are going to do TMS for this child. As spastic diplegia, as you have pointed out, arginase deficiency can present as a spastic diplegia. So you are doing TMS to rule out a hyperarginemia or a arginase deficiency. Good. But cardiac, cardiac evaluation, serum lactate, CPK levels are not essential for this child. So you, okay. are, you, are, you are not going to say what is not important or what is un, not important for the for that particular individual case, okay? Right. And if the child has uh, seizures, then you can include electroencephalography. Otherwise, no need. Next. And spastic diplegia very unusual to have uh, seizures. Seizures. The yeah. incidence of seizures as well as the incidence of MR is very less, okay? They will be asking you about the incidence of seizures, incidence of MR in spastic diplegia as well as in spastic hemiplegia, spastic quadriparsis also. Yes. Next. Sorry. What, what, sorry you need to rush through. One of the important things you need to remember here is the injury is so predominantly on the white matter here with periventricular leukomalacia, and that is why they don't have seizures. Yes. Next round, management. Management is mainly multidisciplinary approach, early intervention and stimulation, with physiotherapy, autotoxy, plaster immobilization, pharmacotherapy, and special education for speech, cognition, behavior, and occupation and treatment of the comorbidities and surgical intervention is necessary. Sir, ask, sir. Ask some more questions in the management. All right, okay. Yes, what do you... uh, yeah. yes, sir. When you say early intervention, how early would you say the intervention should be? Because you are, like, say for this child, there was a very, very clear history that uh, this child was born preterm, there is a spinal uh, swelling, and this child was uh, ventilated for seven days. So all those things are going that together. And they've even done an MR scan at that point. Would you have seen something on the MR scan? And when would the early intervention would you... When would you start the early intervention is my question. What is the early intervention and what would you do? And when? And soon after diagnosing an abnormality, sir, if the MRI was found to be normal, uh, immediate intervention, uh, immediately the early intervention could be started, sir. Uh, the mother had also noted delay in my delay in my son's At least at that point of time, intervention could have been started. See, uh, these kids, when you see this kind of pattern, the early intervention should start as early as possible, really. Because when you see very clearly that all these findings, because all you have to do is a child who's had a seizure within the first 24 hours, that means there is some degree of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Second, born, baby is born premature, ventilated for seven days. When you put all these three together, you can almost be certain that this is how it is going to be. And they have done an MR scan as well early on. And they didn't have the results, but if you have an MR scan, that early intervention is as soon as the child comes out. Like you have to start before the child leaves the neonatal unit. That is when it should be started. And that is when you will get good results. Now, of course, you start with physiotherapy. Orthotics, it won't be necessary until a later stage. Okay, the plaster immobilization, I'm really like, what kind of plaster immobilization are you considering? When you say plaster immobilization, why would you immobilize? Constraint induced movement therapy, sir. Uh, but uh, a constraint induced movement therapy. Anna, that is for hemiplegic CP. Mm -hmm. That is oh. the problem. See, you people are reading everything, and according to the uh, case, you have to tailor made. Okay. That's what uh, Madam also insisted in uh, initially itself. Okay. Yes, you cannot just like that to say everything for every case. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. See, plaster immobilization is not something which you would consider unless the child has got a significant contracture where uh, the, still the contracture is dynamic when you will try to get them into a better position. Okay, okay that is the only situation where, where we will gradually increase the, uh, um, the range of movement. For that, you can use that. That is the only scenario where you will use it. Okay, so immobilization is not to be considered in this thing at all, mostly. Case, at all. Yes, sir. <laughs> How will you manage spasticity in this particular case? Uh, spasticity can be managed with the uh, drugs. drugs man. First, physiotherapy is the treatment of Good. choice. First, physiotherapy. Uh, mm. Drugs. Uh, mm. drugs uh, like uh, first, benzodiazepines can be used. Man. When the seizure is uh, not present, benzodiazepines, uh, uh, is the best. You have drug. to be specific. Are you going to give clobosan? 
no ma'am uh, nitrosepam or uh, nitrosepam or diazepam is the diazepam say diazepam mm. yes good mm. and then uh, baclofen a uh, baclofen can be used uh, 2.5 mm. mg tablet starting at a low dose uh, it can be increased up to 30 mg per day ma'am it is mm. a gaba b mimetic uh, mimetic agent. okay okay next uh, next <laughs> drug is botulinum toxin ma'am uh, it is a presynaptic uh, in it any other is, drug any other drug you can use for spasticity uh, Uh, it is an Indian, ma'am. It is under trial. Mm, good. Mm. Next. Uh, uh, previously, dantolin sodium was used. That you shouldn't mention, mention at all. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Mm. You were telling us something about Botox. Go ahead. Um, uh, Botox. Uh, it really it prevents the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic nerve terminal, ma'am. So, botulinum uh, toxin therapy can be given for this child. Okay. Yes. Right. Next. Uh, Suppose with all these things, the spasticity is not coming down. What are the other options? Um, other surgical therapies can be used, ma'am. Uh, like uh, if there is increased or ankle contracture, tenotomy, ten tendon lengthening procedure. So we are we are discussing about spasticity. Spasticity, uh, selective dorsal rise. Because here, ah, uh, selective dorsal rise anatomy. Here, the problem is the child is not able to stand and walk. Of course, the cognition is better, is it not? Yes, ma'am. Mm. you have said the cognition is okay your language milestones are okay so the only problem is child has to walk a um, child should be ambulant or should walk independently that is the only goal or the only question the mother is asking you whether my child can walk that's all so that should be our aim so for that before uh, your selective dorsal rise anatomy is there anything else any other option baclofen only oral Uh, ah, intrathecal baclofen. Good. So all these options you should remember, and uh, you have to tell us. Okay. Good. Hmm. Any other complication with such an amount of uh, spasticity in the lower limbs? Contractions. Contractions. You have told any other thing? Hip dislocation. You shouldn't forget. Okay. both in floppy child floppy infant whenever you are presenting a floppy infant also you have to say hip dislocation so you have to say about the ultrasonogram pelvis including both the hip joint or extra hip joints to rule out hip dislocation again in the, in uh, cp also you got to mention you have to look for okay good what the angle you will measure ma for uh, uh, dislocation and when would you start checking the uh, hip x ray x rays as ma'am said what age would you start what would you measure we should be able to measure like don't count on orthopedic surgeons so uh, you should start really at 18 months is the advice and uh, what you look for is migration index and there are very very specific ways of doing the x ray if you don't do the x ray properly you'll get it wrong um so you can think the things are normal or you can think it is very abnormal which might not be true so you have a very specific um Um, uh, diagrams which are available, uh, and if you put um, hip pathway, uh, cerebral palsy hip pathway, there are a few diagrams from US uh, which will give you very clearly how the X-ray should be done. Because when it is flexed at the knees, uh, you have to have some kind of a support to keep it in a good position to do that. So the migration index you have to measure it, and you can uh, read through that. I'm not going to tell you more. so migration index if it is more than 30 degrees you need to really watch closely if it is less than 30 degrees depending on what level it is you think about whether you are going to do it every 6 months or once a year if it is completely if you feel it is completely normal you have to keep doing it one year any child who is not walking from 18 months on you have to do the hip pathway and this is a thing in many of the western countries if you don't do it i can be sued okay go on yeah. ma We haven't got much time. Sorry. Next. Yeah. Uh, Special uh, education. Comorbid conditions you mentioned. What are the comorbid conditions you are considering? Cognitive impairment, behavioral disturbance, vision, speech, hearing defects, uh, bladder bowel disturbances. Okay. So. Um, so bladder bowel and things so see these are the things that you need to remember um, you mentioned it beforehand which i'm quite happy about the neuroplasticity you mentioned and how things can get worse after a certain period and what is that related to so although the encephalopathy is static the injury to the brain is static 
you can see a deterioration in uh, gait. Can you not sometimes with static uh, spastic diplegia? Why is that? Why do you see a deterioration clinically, although the child has uh, got a diplegia, which is a static encephalopathy? Is it too late? Are you all too hungry? So, so the important thing to remember is the growth phases. Because they are growing quite fast, the bone grows much better. The muscles do not grow. The spastic muscles do not grow as well. They will be smaller and uh, they will not grow adequately. Because they do not grow adequately, you will develop contractures much more easily. That's why physiotherapy is so important to carry on throughout the growth phase. Okay. So they are more likely to develop contractures and they might even go off their feet if you don't give proper physiotherapy, although the brain injury is the same. So that is something uh, you need to remember. Okay. Um, Okay, mother, you can have learning difficulties, you can have other things. So with type DJ, you usually don't, because as long as the gray matter is not affected, uh, it usually do quite well. Surgical intervention, what are the surgical interventions you can think of? Then embryo transfer, phenotomy, um, orthodesis, a muscle transfer, a selective dorsal rhizotomy. Orthodesis is very unusual, ma. Uh, yes. That is uh, not something I've come across often. So what else did you say? Tenotomy, yes. Tenotomy, tendon lengthening procedure, tendon transfer. Yeah. And um, so these are the things which you, they do do it. But what you need to remember is it has to be done very carefully, uh, depending on the age. Because uh, you do the tendon lengthening earlier, you cannot keep on repeating it again and again. So if you do the tendon lengthening, it has to be done at one point. And after that, if when you do the second time, it is going to be not so successful. And uh, second time, they probably wouldn't even do it. So that is something you need to remember. So you need to stretch it as much as possible. And this is where Botox comes in very effective. So the Botox works for something like about six months or so. And if you give good physiotherapy along with the Botox injection. So what you need to remember is if you can do that and stretch the period when you go for the surgery as much as possible, by the time the growth has ended. So by the time the child is about 15 or so and the growth is completely completed, then that might be the best time to do the surgery because you're not going to get any further um, uh, tightness or so related to that. Okay, so surgical interventions is easy, but so the important thing to remember is a child with cerebral palsy keeps coming back and forth to you. The important things to watch the patient, of course, and the spine. It can slowly bend through because of the difference in tone. Because it's not just the limb tone which is affected, the uh, truncal tone will also be affected to some extent. So that can affect the, uh, the these children can develop um, uh, contractures, particularly the way they are sitting and uh, the kind of charts they are provided. So that is something you need to be very, very careful about because that will have a direct impact on the child's longevity. Any other uh, 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 advice you have given to the mother? Any uh, other advice you will you give? Uh, counseling to the mother, ma'am, that uh, uh, we should give emotional support to the mother uh, to handle the psychological stress and should explain to the mother that it is a long process and uh, a constant physical... Apart therapy. from this, in this particular child, the child had a meningocele, is it not? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, bowel and bladder has to be taken care of, ma'am. As the child has not attained the control till now, uh, she should concentrate on it. Uh, what about for the next pregnancy? Yes, That's what we are asking. So this is a neural tube defect also. This is a particular child. This is an unusual child in whom there is an, uh, there is an uh, a neural tube defect associated with uh, the child has a cerebral palsy associated with the neural tube defect also. Yes. Is it not? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Very good. Very good. What is the dose? Uh, normally 0.4 mg is advised, ma'am. For this case, 4 mg uh, tablet should be taken at least 3 months prior to consumption. Okay. This particular mother had another child also, third child also. The yes, child is normal? Yes, ma'am. Normal, ma'am. Okay. Term Whether this, uh, this uh, particular case underwent uh, MRI brain, have you done it? And the what are the, uh, the, the, the third child is, uh, uh, has not been evaluated yet, ma'am. No, ma'am. This particular child whom you have presented. 
yes ma'am mri is being taken now ah uh, what are the findings ma'am the finding is not available with the child ma'am and uh, at present uh, the mri we did now shows periventricular leukomalacia ma'am that's all yes ma'am any other ventricular megaly whether the spine is normal any other abnormality uh, no, arnal cherry nothing no ma'am no arnal cherry spine uh, appears to be normal ma'am no other defect ma'am very good very good okay okay fine good sir any other question if you are doing a presentation like this do always add in the axial image of t2 ma for yeah. uh, 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 diplegia that to give us a very very good idea of what kind of uh, lesion are we seeing okay sir okay the other differential diagnosis for uh, spastic diplegia you have mentioned about uh, number one is diplegic cp and then any other differential diagnosis just forget about this case this child had a this child was a preterm had a definite history of uh, a sentinel event suggestive of uh, hie so we are not thinking in terms of any other uh, etiology in this particular case of course whether there is associated spinal dystrophism is there or not we have to consider and you have said that the mri spinal cord is normal suppose everything is normal there is no sentinel event at all then what are the other differential diagnosis will you consider in this case spastic diplegia अर्जिनेस डेफिशिएंसी गुड आईएम सो अर्जिनेस डेफिशिएंसी यस मेडिकल स्पास्टिक पैरालिसिस हम सो यर्ली लिकोडिस्ट्रोफीज देन हेरिडिटरी स्पास्टिक पैराप्लीजिया देन पैरोसिन हाइड्रोक्सिलिस डेफिशिएंसी पार्डन मी पैरोसिन हाइड्रोक्सिलिस डेफिशिएंसी पैरोसिन हाइड्रोक्स न्यूरो न्यूरो नो देन one more <laughs> just only one more congenital muscular dystrophy no my dear do not deviate uh, more only more one more is doper responsive dystonia always in any spastic diplegia you have to remember doper when the mri is normal when there is no specific history suggestive of hie always you have to give a trial of doper uh, to verify whether this is a doper responsive dystonia or not okay that is the uh, another differential diagnosis so you should always remember okay fine very good very good presentation nice sir over to you sir madam sundari nothing more to add you have been so thorough uh, well done um, um, madam sundari madam sundari it was really good uh, very detailed uh, it sometimes it goes into so much of detail you all the important facts are all uh, completely submerged and it would be nice to just take those important facts out as and when and then you put them all together and when you summarize all those important facts should come out okay ma that would be more only simple advice uh, one single advice i would have okay thank you very much ma'am madam stop slide sir Yeah, it is a really uh, nice presentation by Trinidad uh, Medical College uh, postgraduates, and um, and uh, Madam has made them prepare very well, Arun Sri Madam, and it's a uh, uh, excellent presentation, Madam Dr. Arun Sri Madam. Thank yeah. you, sir. Actually, uh, uh, for this uh, nice online platform, that is a comprehensive uh, teaching learning program. We should thank you, sir. and i am much surprised by the efforts you are taking as a trio i used to be, uh, see that um, iap tnc youtube sir all this almost i have seen now usually in the night i used to see and i also asked my pgs to go through and that also helped them to have a nice presentation thank you sir yeah i thank uh, dr krishnamurthy sir actually he really helped me uh, to make this uh, possible yeah, and sir. uh dr tenavali medical college uh, presenting case actually lot of post graduate from tenoral medical in top level in uh, uh, india as well as abroad also and uh, it's really they done very well and uh, uh, it is now um, i request uh, dr prc sir come and please sir am i audible yeah yeah yes, sir yeah thank you so uh, uh, so it's a wonderful presentation by the candidate from tenoral uh, medical college Uh, headed by a mentor uh, on the sea and plus a beautiful uh, uh, analytical discussion by both uh, dr gail murugan and dr sri babalin so 
He enjoyed it very much. Uh, I'd just like to tell the candidate that uh, uh, there will be definitely some questions where you will not be knowing answers or some things which you think that uh, the examiner will want you to do more. So that is part of the learning. So the, the minute you think that everything has been said, then there is no more learning. So there will be always some inputs. But you have done really well. You have covered all the important aspects that you presented very confidently. So congratulations to the whole team of uh, PG students. So you were able to describe most of the clinical findings very well. And a good videos. So I appreciate the interest you have taken to show the clinical presentation in the form of video. So that also gives us a real good feel of the case in this uh, virtual platform. So appreciate uh, all your efforts. A few things, uh, one thing I'd just like to mention is always think about the family. Tell something like uh, what are the social support available for them, like uh, DEIC, whether they are enrolled in DEIC or anything. So these are all maybe expected uh, from some of the examiners. So you can just mention about that. This family seems to be really not, uh, I don't know, because of it, this child, another one month, one year interval, they got another child. And if you had uh, answered about whether the mother has undergone uh, sterilization or still she is uh, capable of reproduction, all these questions like uh, later uh, uh, periconceptive folic acid will become very relevant. Okay, so please take a very comprehensive family history and also social support and how we can help the whole family. So that should be your attitude as a general pediatrician. Thank you. Dr. Srinivasan sir. Yeah, there is. So unmute sir, unmute. Comprehensive discussion and uh, Dr. Ramchanan has already given comprehensive comments. I agree with him. So it's a definitive examination case, so you should know everything about it. Of course, the questions which have been asked at, uh, to get you get more marks. Okay, so so that you know, if you do in one good case, even if some other difficult case comes, you will be able to compensate. So not for passing. Passing, of course, basic questions will be asked, but other questions which have been asked is to make you get. Uh, more marks and more credit. Thank you so much. Thank you very well. Yeah, Dr. Um, Lima, Madam, final conclusion. Uh, congratulations all the uh, to Dr. Ma Madhushri and you have done really well and uh, mm -hmm. all these questions are asked for, uh, for uh, that is uh, our uh, aim is that you should be familiar with all types of questions. In the exam hall, you should not uh, uh, think about the, oh, this question I haven't faced so far. This is a question, new question I am being thrown upon. No, not like that. You should have been exposed to every type of question in that particular topic. That is our aim. Okay. So you have done so well. Congratulations for your friends also. And uh, as uh, PRC sir said, your videos were very good. You have elicited the clinical findings and uh, you have uh, your method of elicitation was correct. So nice, well done. Yeah, Dr. Well Morgan, yeah. Oh, well, thanks very much. I have to thank uh, Lima, ma'am, for uh, uh, taking the lead through because I'm not that very confident about uh, teaching for uh, exams here. Uh, so many of my facts were uh, going on about uh, clinical aspects. Um, one of the, I'm really impressed about the video. And uh, one of the things to do is to make their kind of uh, normal limb movements and then uh, do that. Uh, so like not just uh, eliciting a reflex, just the child lying down and moving the limbs can be also be very helpful um, through, but uh, very good effort from Madhav Sundari. Uh, Madhav Sundari, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, well done. And uh, the questions which have come out thrown on you is from two pediatric neurologists. So you won't have that tough questions uh, from the general pediatric uh, examiners. So they will be a lot more kinder to you. Remember that you've done well. And yeah. we appreciate Madam Anandi Sri also for uh, for uh, uh, yeah. for their uh, for her guidance and uh, support to her PGs. Uh, uh, they have done really well, Madam. Yes, thank you, Madam. Actually, you know. Uh, because the, the, they haven't met you in person, but they you know, know about you. 
Uh, they have seen some of the video classes by you, and they were uh, really fear to present. And uh, somehow, no. Now this class, no, is very very informative. Actually, this will help all the PGs to face the exam. Uh, that's what. That's yeah, that's our aim. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I uh, especially that's thank, our duty to uh, teach the these people. Each yeah, and every what... one of you for your nice academic fees today, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very all. much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of IAPTNSC, I thank today's uh, chairperson, Dr. Lima, and uh, Dr. Anand Sri, moderator, and uh, my batchmate and uh, classmate, Dr. El Murugan. He's a, a good, always a good teacher. And uh, I, I thank our uh, today's uh, judges, uh, Dr. PRC, sir. Always you will end or you will ask a lot of questions. I'm really, really happy that. Uh, he is participating in every uh, PG teaching program. I thank Dr. Srinivasan sir, and he is always uh, motivating us to make uh, classes. And uh, I thank Dr. Srinivasan sir, and uh, thank all the postgraduates from uh, Thirunelveli Medical College and Madhavasri, um, who has presented extremely very well. And as uh, Dr. PRC sir said, you know, that uh, video presentations always really helpful for other postgraduates uh, to learn. So and again, on behalf of IAPT, I thank Onandal for this uh, wonderful uh, case presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Good night.